can't go through everything we did yesterday because um, some of you will have heard it before because I've seen you at other retrofit reimagined uh, pieces and there was a lot about how to host. Um, so I'm going to kind of skip through um, some of those bits and just tell you about the headlines of what we feel is really important here even though we're on the last formal day and I know some people are staying until uh, tomorrow. But we, um, we really talked yesterday about what it means to create a space that um, is co-hosted by us all, um, what it means to help each other to cross different thresholds um, that they might not think are for them. Um, like you might see on the schedule, there's a straw bale building session and you're like, do I need to be a builder to go to that? And you have, may, may have never ever encountered anything like that. And, um, and what it means for us to support one another, to cross different thresholds, learn about new things, to explore the site, um, to get hands-on, to host an intergenerational community where there are children and elders of all ages, of all different um, access needs, of different skills and wisdoms and gifts, and how important it is to really look after one another. Uh, within that, encourage one another and support one another to make the most of the day. We've got a really incredible um, set of co-programming happening today. And for those of you who are staying until tomorrow, just, oh, OK, nobody in this room, a couple of people. OK, so, um, and, and critically, um, there, in order to make the most of the many things that are going on, um, the biggest tip we gave everyone yesterday was after this session, or even during the session, if you can't quite hold back, um, go and sign up and plan for your day. Uh, the transitions between things are really hard, right? Because it's an amazing site with lots of amazing um, uh, things that can distract you from where you're heading. And therefore, often the transitions between different sessions can be really, really difficult. So I'm in, in a positive way. So I'm inviting you all to make sure that you create a little plan. Um, you take one of the, oh, I had a pile here yesterday, but you take one of the little programs. There we go, Pauline's got one in her hand. Uh, you take one of those programs, you use that to navigate the map, navigate particularly lunch and dinner times. Uh, everything worked really well yesterday in terms of just go and have your lunch in the appropriate slot during those two hours and the same with dinner. Um, uh, in addition to some of this, uh, on the wall is a wider schedule, so you can see what's happening at different times. For example, the straw bale building is happening quite a few times this morning, and uh, today. So if you don't make the first one, you want to go to something else, please do go and connect with that. Um, uh, so just practically making the most of being here, uh, especially given that some of you lost quite a bit of time yesterday due to the travel, really involves um, you going and putting your name down to a session and sort of navigating your day around all the things that you might want to go to. Um, a small little thing uh, is that if you are here with children, um, overall the children will remain the responsibility of the parents, carers and guardians that have bought them. Um, so it's really, really important, um, parents, carers, guardians, that you know where your children are, um, that you are going with them if they're going to uh, look at a practical workshop, especially if there's lots of tools, etc. cetera. Um, and thirdly, because there's one or two things where the children, unfortunately, due to insurances, can't actually participate in the making and building, but can be supported by uh, their parent and guardian to participate. And thirdly, if you want to drop your children off somewhere, you have to drop them into the forest school and you have to make sure that they don't just wander out of that forest school. Um, and that's really, really important. Obviously, the practitioners over at the forest school are working hard on that, but that is the only place that you can go and drop off and take part in a, in a session. Um, so just please do uh, look after that because that's um, something that we navigated really well all together yesterday. But um, yeah, it was it's quite it's quite hard, um, and there isn't um, massive safety concerns because it's quite a contained site. But it is really important. It is easy just to take the wrong path in cat and suddenly be like, I have no idea where I am. 
Um, in addition, we also encouraged everyone yesterday and when we arrived on Friday to remember that we're a community co-hosting this together. So um, there, you spot a child wandering off in the wrong direction or looking a bit uh, concerned, maybe just go and say, hey, check in and uh, bring them back to the WISE uh, main courtyard um, where we can relocate them and reunite them with their parents. And um, finally, on that practical note, there is a WhatsApp group um, that we promise you will not endlessly be in your lives forever. It's just for this weekend. Um, and it's just helping people to navigate things like, hi, I'm in this barn, I don't know how to get back, or could somebody give me a lift to here, or I need a bit of help, or I, you know, as I mentioned yesterday, last year at some point I was stung by a wasp here and I had to go to the medical centre because it got a bit out of control. So if something happens, don't struggle with it by yourself. Just message in the WhatsApp group or come back to the WISE building uh, and speak to one of the Civic Square team um, who are also got many other people um, supporting them. So um, just those practicals. We hope you have an amazing day. If you, if you get your day planned right, there is quite a lot you can fit into today and a lot of it also is outdoors um, and in lots of different practical um, sessions. Again, hi to everyone who joins us uh, on the live stream. Everything that's in here will be live stream and recorded throughout the day. Um, so you can pop back in and there's a, there's a sheet up there about the amazing talks that we're going to hear in this room from uh, Quajo and Abdi um, and Alice Fowler and I can't remember the other two, but there's a few more underneath as well. Um, so do join us back in here if you need a bit of respite and sit back and listen to some incredible practitioners talking about the work that they are doing. Okay, so a little quick kind of run through about what, where it is that we're at. Um, last year, we uh, hosted a festival in a field in Birmingham, uh, in, our host, in our home neighborhood, Ladywood. Um, which was just really focused on this idea. And a really simple um, kind of origin of this story was that in 2020, um, I remember reading uh, an article uh, that said that nearly, I don't know how, quite how much, if Charlie was here, he'd always give my fact checking. So if you want to know the precise amount, Charlie's around, ask him. But that a, a large amount of... Um, many hundreds of millions, perhaps 500 million, uh, had been returned to government in something called the Green Homes Grant, which was meant to support uh, homes to be insulated um, and to be retrofitted. And there was this article and this big moment where a lot of money had been returned to central government with the idea that there wasn't enough uptake of retrofit, right? And uh, I, remember, I remember reading this and thinking, what? You know, it was pandemic year. Um, we knew the first signs of the energy crisis that was going to hit. Um, if you, there was a number of different things where it was pretty obvious that lots was going to happen with inflation and the cost of living, given what was happening in the pandemic. And I was just kind of like a bit blown away that, what do you mean there's low uptake? Every neighborhood practitioner that I know, uh, Melissa will come and join me in a second to share a bit about We Can Make. Um, you'll hear from Quaja and Abdi later. Every person I know who's working in their neighbourhoods, whether it's on material need and crisis in that moment or mutual aid or f like visionary futures or whatever in the middle of that, absolutely knows really, really in their heart and in their intuition that there's nobody who wouldn't want a warmer, safer cheaper to run home, that's in a street that is cleaner, more biodiverse, where the air is cleaner, the noise pollution is less, their children are safer, their elders are, about, are able to get about. Um, and I just found this, this like absolutely bonkers. And so some of you will know that this um, festival is in partnership with a number of different people. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about how and why we got here. So just to say, we are now here we have been in woodlands, in swimming pools, in, uh, in the Centre for Alternative Technology, in a factory in Nor West, uh, in the media centre there. And uh, we'll also be at Civic House in Glasgow on the 11th of November. So from this field, uh, we came to this festival. 
And I'll tell you a tiny bit more in a second. So at that point, our partners, Dark Matter Labs, don't worry about the detail here. It's meant to be purposely fuzzy and confusing. Uh, but if you are really interested in the detail, we've got lots and lots of ways in which you can get into all the nerdy papers and research. But in the middle of that, it says low take up of housing retrofit work. After that big moment where the money had gone back, Dark Matter Labs, our partners who really work on uh, the systemic nature of challenges, how we unpack and visualize those, and then how we build um, more visionary futures from there. And what you started to realize is that it wasn't just this simple, oh, nobody wants it, which we all know, right? It's like when people say communities are hard to reach. It's like, oh, they're not hard to reach. Um, there's many, many different layers as to why um, th that money went back, but also why there is low uptake of, of housing retrofit, which just to leave the language out of the room for a second, let's just talk about warmer, safer, cheaper to hunt, run homes, and if you can take your imagination further in streets that have cleaner air, that are more biodiverse, that have less cars, where the communities are more connected, and we'll go a bit further in our work where we believe that the, the wealth generated can be uh, kept within the neighborhood where the skills to do that work are generated in a place and where all of this can be seen as a site of deep imagination. And, um, and so we sort of carried on in this to like keep finding out more. And you'll hear so much more about this from Kwejo and Abdi and many others throughout the day. But this was a second diagram that really kind of got, got me um, interested in why, why then retrofit? Like, why is that and why is the house, the street in the neighborhood, a really critical site for imagination? Why is that such an important place that people like us who've been organizing in our places for many, many years could mix that deep imagination, courage, community, mutual aid, uh, connection, creativity that's in our neighbourhoods with um, the work that we're doing to practically organise um, with a challenge or a big issue that we have that people can relate with that also would have a deeply uh, profound impact on our ability to uh, step up to the climate and ecological emergencies. So that for us became like, okay, the home is the site where you live where your hopes and dreams, your everyday realities play out, both positive and negative. But it's also then must be a place that you feel most agency to do something about things rather than thinking, ah, climate crisis. So when I saw this diagram, I started to realize like, okay, when we have underperforming housing, the impacts at many, many different layers are huge, whether that be in, the, in your relationships, in the quality of the air, in the mold, in your health, in the educational outcomes, in your social mobility, in your ability to access things, uh, be in work, etc., uh, etc. Et and you keep going through um, all of these layers and you start to realize the impacts this is having. Uh, our homes are also responsible for significant amounts of carbon emissions just to heat them. Um, and, you know, Scott's talk yesterday and more talks today um, will tell you more about this, but feel free to go back to the link and watch Scott's talk yesterday because it was really great breakdown of, like, the, the, how much of these are uh, social and ecological issues um, really uh, connected together. And so you start to get this really big story where from these, individ from these homes that are... are are in such a state of disrepair or um, needing deep retrofit and you have this story of like nobody wants it and then you have this energy crisis and you have all these neighborhood organizers saying, hold on, no, they really do. We just don't have the power and the resources and the agency to be able to actually show what needs to happen. We went on a bit of a journey with this and we, we found ourselves really starting to understand the home street and neighborhood is a huge site of imagination. And then the last thing I want to say on this is, um, wow, that, that QR code's big, isn't it? Um, but then we sort of explored this a little bit more in that there is this really incredibly important story about the civic power and capacity that exists at the scale of the home street and neighborhood and its transformative capacity um, and, and the imagination and creativity and courage of, that can be unlocked in that. 
Um, but then there's also this other story of a much wider accountability. Um, and this blog starts to talk about some of the stories uh, and numbers and, uh, like, I'd say corruption that sits at the heart of your energy bills going up to 300% whilst the energy companies have been taking home huge dividends and profits. And you'll hear a little bit more from Quajo uh, later on as well about the deep, um, like, uh, lack of accountability that exists at this level of the state as well. So these were sort of some of the stories about why we thought this was so important. And, um, and so we started to talk about another really key thing. And this is really important because, because it wasn't just, hey, we need to retrofit these homes. Some of you heard Kate Rayworth's talk yesterday. If you didn't, I'd really recommend listening to the talk back because it wasn't just, hey, let's just, at any cost, let's just try and spend, get, get more money and spend it within the existing economic model. Out of that big map that you saw at the beginning, there's, on the left, these are some of the reasons why this stuff isn't working. We're treating one of the most important moments of our uh, history where we need to transition from a divisive, extractive um, uh, system towards something much more regenerative, people and planet-centered that it is based on very different values. So what you started to see was some of those challenges. We also needed deep shifts in how we think about this. So there's blogs and work for anyone who wants to go much, much deeper into this. We can, we can share that with you outside of here. But we started to pose some shifts. We needed to go away from individual customers to neighborhood collectives where wealth and skills and knowledge and agency and creativity can be uh, unlocked and retained in much more regenerative and circular ways in our neighborhoods. We need to go away from house by house. You can have five grand for your house. You can have five grand for your house. You can have five grand for your house. And 50 different practitioners uh, and companies will come out however many times on a street, 36 times individually and insulate your house differently and do yours again and we need to move into the street as a living system where we can actually join up the cumulative effects of yes solar yes insulation but also we know many other things we know when communities start to get organized as you'll hear if you go to melissa's um, neighborhood organizing session later what they can do is magical. When they have access to the means of production, to the resources, to the knowledge, they're literally building homes in Knoll West. Um, but they also want to be biodiversifying their front lawns. They also want to be cleaning up the air. They also are organizing around solar on their school roofs, as you heard from, um, from Power. We need to move away from this being complex and confusing and into really empowering knowledge systems that help people, as you might know from Centric Labs' work, whose talks are in our, um, in our archive from last year's Retrofit Reimagined, but also from this year's, that when you give people the access to their knowledge about what the air or the noise is doing, that actually you start to have incredible resistance in organizing. And I won't carry on, but basically, we started to posit a number of shifts that were critical. It isn't just about, within this 20th century economic model, let's just do as much as we can. It was about a shift, a shift of how we think, a shift of how we organize, a shift of where the, where the value is created and who it returns to, where the skills come from, where the knowledge comes from. And it was really, really important to us that we started to shift this idea that communities and the people who live in their home streets and neighborhoods are just someone you ask later on, or you just ask them some questions, and then somebody more important with more power and more knowledge will come and deliver. And instead, that the home street and neighborhood was this incredible site of massive transformation and transition. Um, I won't talk too much about those big challenges, but I would recommend if you're interested in those sorts of things, Scott McCauley's talk from yesterday or the Building Centre, Kate Rayworth's talk from yesterday, Indy Johar's talk from the Building Centre, they're all in the archive already. I'd go back and watch some of these for some of that wider context. And so this was us in the field. People came from all over the place. We were really surprised. There was neighbors, there was architects, there was policy peeps, there was poets, there was kids, there was some of you. And we were like, oh, okay, the AJ wrote about it. And they were like, it was like no other uh, built environment uh, festival we've ever been to. And so we were like, oh, oh, damn. Like we're onto something now, we've got to keep going. 
So um, uh, Melissa will share a bit in a second, but Melissa uh, was one of the partners that was there last year. And anyway, a whole bunch of us came together and said, right, we need to get moving really quickly. A lot, a lot, a lot of money is going to have to be spent on this built environment transition, like it's a bit jargony, but this, this set of things that are going to need to happen to help us survive let alone anything else, as you may know, as you may have seen from the floods in the last few days. Right, let's get organised. Let's get ready to be able to say, listen, communities aren't just a place where you um, come and try and get us to say yes to decisions you've already made. We are going to be at the forefront of the big transitions that are, are going to be required in the next decade or will come upon us. Um, and we knew that from the pandemic, right? Terrible things happened. There's no doubt of glorifying or romanticising the pandemic in a way that is untrue. But we also know that the neighbourhood scale was where most uh, creativity and agency and connectedness and first response and mutual aid was able to thrive. So that's us. This is what we're doing. We're going on tour. Uh, we've still got Glasgow left, so you can join us on the Access Fund as well in Glasgow. Um, this is us in the swimming pool. This is us in a woodland. This is, us, uh, this is the theme of the festival, which is really about rebuilding our relationship with land, with each other, with the materials that we use. And again, uh, Indy and Kate's talks, but other talks throughout the festival really give you a bit of an insight on that materials piece. Because it, even if we say, we've got all the technology, we just need to implement it, not strictly true. Because just one example is like, where are we mining the lithium for solar panels? Who is it going to come from? Is this material and resource colonisation 2.0? We need to start asking ourselves some real questions. We don't have the carbon budget to build 300,000 new homes. If we do it anyway, we'll just be taking from the rest of the world like we have for centuries. But what does that mean? What does that mean about how we redesign, how we live, how we might retrofit and uh, change the homes that we're in? Um, we invite everyone to get into the knotty problems and the dark part of this and the bit that is complicated and like we don't quite have answers for in order to unlock that creativity and not to scare us. So for us, it really matters that we get into some of those knots so that we can actually start to use the best of what humans are able to do and use their ingenuity to redesign our lives in more just and equitable ways. So I said earlier about the practicals, go figure out what you're doing today because it will be really, really important. These were some of the principles we talked about yesterday. But just to remind you, hard on ideas, soft on people. Um, remember that uh, know when it's right for you to take up space. If you're someone who enjoys uh, easily being able to be in spaces to speak, know when it's right to speak up and to support someone else, and know when it's right to step back. And if you're someone that is from a more marginalized identity that doesn't often uh, able to take up space, uh, pull your shoulders out, step in, and, uh, and trust others to make space for you, but also uh, know as a community how to give space to one another. And there's a few others um, that we talked about yesterday as well, but I think some of you were in that, so I won't go through it again. Um, so yeah, just a final reminder to say that we still have the last of the Access Fund to come and join us in Glasgow. Um, we are looking at who wants to start organising in their neighbourhoods and communities. So there's a map outside where you can say we're really up for this. And I'm just going to hear really, um, re just say really quickly that everything from all across here is on the YouTube already. So if you've missed anything, head into there. Um, and we haven't got Sarah, have we? So, okay, so do you want to come up with this? So Melissa's just going to share a little bit about um, being one of the partners in this big party of us. Um, and then I'm going to tell you a bit more about where we are today and why we're here and pass over to Eileen, who's one of the co-CEOs at the Centre for Alternative Technology. Oh, actually, maybe you can just use this. Is that on? Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So I'm, um, I'm Melissa from uh, We Can Make in Bristol. And um, the, the image that Imi showed of, of the field last year that was retrofit reimagined last year, I was just a punter that went there. I was just a punter. And, and now, a year on, a complete kind of co-conspirator and helping to host. So everyone, be ready, okay? This is your first step into being an ally, being part of retrofit reimagined. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And I think, I mean, why it's so kind of joyful and brilliant to be part of this is because 
you know, looking at the climate collapse and the nightmarish of that and the heaviness of that is and can be overwhelming. And it's, there's no denying that and there's no not facing that. But at the same time, we also have um, extraordinary people, extraordinary organisations stepping up and creating something else and the sense that things can be different and we can shape the income outcomes and we can make a difference. And Retrofit Reimagined is is building that and it is that kind of movement building and that's why it is irresistible to be part of that and so this is part of the invitation to be part of that and be help to build um you know a counterpoint to some of that darkness and kind of heaviness um and i think it's kind of that sense kind of coming from from we can make we're based in a 100 year old council built estate in bristol and um you know a lot of kind of people, outside people, look at our estate and just see our high levels of multiple disadvantage, our kind of crumbling public realm, um, you know, our no insulation, gas powered, kind of fuel poverty kind of homes. They just kind of see us as a problem to be fixed or even kind of demolished and started again. And I think, you know, in that, it's just sense the huge sense of waste there, the waste of carbon, but also the waste of social capital and people's wisdom and people's kind of know-how. And so this and retrofit re reimagined is a start in a completely different place, not in that problem to be fixed kind of space, but in that let's tap into that imagination and wisdom and know-how that we know is in our communities and how can we surface that and bubble that up. Um, and you know, we're feeling that the sparks there, the glimmers are there in, in Knoll West already. You'll hear later from Jazz Tippett, who's a wonderful um, local community member. She has taken on a whole great big neglected green space and turned it into the most beautiful, thriving space for food, joy, welcoming. And it's those kind of sparks that we're building and trying to connect them up that it begins to get a sense that other things are kind of possible. So this is definitely your invitation to be part of something and sort of thinking about how you can get involved and how you can connect with others. So definitely talk to other people, connect, and let's see what we can grow next. Uh, yeah, so um, me and Jazz are gonna be talking at um, two o'clock in the Straw Bale building out, outside in the Send. Um, and Jazz is going to uh, share her experience as a community organiser. Uh, it's this big kind of green space on the edge of Knoll West that nobody stepped inside ever. There was great kind of fear. And now it's become a real hub for the whole kind of community. So we're going to be talking about some of the, in this big overwhelming kind of sense of kind of climate collapse and retrofit and all of these things, what are the first steps and first moves that people can make and how you can do that? And the kind of messages that it's, doesn't matter how f small that first kind of step is, lots of small adds up to something very big if you kind of keep on going. So, you know, we're starting with front gardens. We're, talk we're starting with what can we make in our m micro factory to kind of do retrofit components from kind of windows made out of dieback ash to doing different kind of, you know, uh, cladding for, for, for buildings. So you, you, looking at the resources and tools that you've got, you can begin to stitch together a very different kind of future. So you're all invited. We can share tips. It's going to be really practical. And you've got to meet Jazz because she is phenomenal. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and I can see that Sarah's in the room. So in a second, I'll... Um, well, af actually, after Eileen shared, I'll get us to share a little bit more. But um, for, for us, a really critical thing that I would love you to hold as you go around today is that yet yeah, all through yesterday, all through the festival, all through today, you are going to hear from people doing profound work in their largely their neighbourhoods and their cities. And it's easy for people to tell you a story that that is small, nice projects over there. Okay? It's easy to, for people to isolate those stories of, oh, that's nice, Emmy's doing that in Civic Square in Birmingham, and Abdi's doing that in Tower Hamlets, and, and Quajo's doing really important work, and Melissa, you know, she's doing really important it's, it's amazing, it's celebrated, but it's small. It's not, it's not what the real power, you know, we've got the big problems to solve. One thing I really want you to hold is that all through history, all through history, and there's many histories we can tell this story through, we have been through journeys whereby the people in their places, whether it's organizing around material need, whether it's about building the starts of new institutions, whether it's through mutual aid, whether it's through emergencies, the people have always organized what the future will be. Those things then get captured and become the new public goods. And one example of that, being in Wales, is the Tredegar Medical Aid Society's 
60, Medical Aid Society, 60 years before the NHS came into being. That was everyday people organising around their material needs at a time when what if everybody had access to healthcare at point of need, not if they could pay, would have been like a, oh my God, question. Like in the class system, in everything that was happening at that time, that would have seemed completely unfathomable. And over a number of different things, number of different years, through policy, through emergency moments, through the moment post-war, through the organizing of people, through campaigning, through many, many, many different layers, came the moment where uh, that quote that Bevan shared around, I'm going to tradigarize the country, um, became the starts of the NHS, a moment where, I mean, even though we have to fight, fight for it at the moment, um, a moment where free healthcare at point of access for everyone had become the norm. That was a new public good. And there's many stories you can tell of this. This is how the libraries came around. This is how the vote came around. This is how uh, before complete annihilation in particularly the Global South, the First Nations, indigenous peoples had organized around building the right relationships between their social and, um, and needs as a community and as a society and the land that they were, they were in. We as humans, despite our, um, despite the narratives of uh, what we are capable of, have been able to, at moments in history, not take the most destructive, most disaster capitalist approach. We have been able to do things like build the libraries. We have been able to do things like build the NHS. We have been able to do things that have enabled us to want better for one another. Um, after, uh, was it Finland? When, was it Finland that India was telling us about, uh, Melissa? After Finland went bankrupt, or Denmark went bankrupt, um, in the two years afterwards, one of their approaches that they uh, took was to invest uh, the, some of the most amount of money into public education to enable the country to rebuild itself rather than take a really destructive and extractive pro uh, approach. So all these things and people you're hearing from today may be... It won't look exactly like we can make. It won't exactly look like Civic Square. It won't exactly look like Quajo or Abdi or Amara's work or uh, Sarah's work or all the different... But what it will look like is a combination of people from very, very different backgrounds working towards North Stars that are um, uh, collective, that are centering a just and equitable transition coming together across those boundaries and believing that whether we see it in our lifetimes or not, we are building, we are building a, a new uh, set of ideas for the economy, for how we live with one another. And I know that for many people, this is very, very real right now um, in terms of how uh, Palestinian people are fighting back for the occupied, uh, the land that has been occupied from when we watched Powerlands last night. Um, we know that over history, the people have a lot of power in barn raising the new institutions, the new public goods uh, of the future. And we know we're against a big battle. It's not like we're pretending that. But when the center of this festival is, what if um, the climate transition and retrofit of our home streets and ne neighborhoods was owned, governed, and designed by the people who live there? That might sound like a really big question. But when you start to listen to Kate, and you hear that the, that the economy can change, what we centre can change, all the tools are there. When you're about to hear from Eileen about turning uh, this slate quarry into a thriving uh, centre for alternative technology, when you hear about the shifts that Quajo has been able to, when you hear what Coffee Afrique is doing, when you go and see what We Can Make are doing, when you listen to Sarah and Rachel later and the many others, don't see this as, oh, well, that was nice. Remember, this is the start of a new story and it's just a long time in the making. So you God, I don't quite know where we are at in it, okay? I don't know if we're 20 years in. I don't know if the tipping point's next year or it's 10 years from now. But just remember to take a step back and see our generation as part of a wider story fighting for something much broader. And so on that note, it's really a pleasure to say thank you so much to the Centre for Alternative Technology for hosting us. Because here's a, here's a place that has been going for 50 years and we're a group of people that came to this empty black slate quarry and have restored it into something that has been a huge resource for us. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of neighbours have come to CAT from Ladywood and across Birmingham over the last couple of years for practical workshops, for, from uh, uh, 
learning about carbon literacy to making to tool skills as well as cat practitioners come into Birmingham to do trade schools um, and as well as the many other programs that we have been very uh, lucky to host here so cat for us is a story of what happens when you really believe that in something much bolder than many others and stick to it and I'm really grateful for you having us here because we have let me just say we have taken over okay like ridiculously and they've really put up with us so please make sure you keep everything tidy don't break anything take your plates back all of that sort of stuff but we're really really grateful for for the hosting and I'm just going to hand over to Eileen to give you a bit of an introduction to Cap. I'm Eileen, I'm co-CEO here at CAT. I'd just like to take this opportunity to welcome you all. Uh, well done on making it here. How many of you have been to CAT before? Oh, quite about half of you probably. Um, so you might already know all about what we do here, but for those of you that haven't been here before, I just want to talk a little bit about what we do here at CAT, our history, um, what we do now, um, I'm not going to take up too much of your time because it's a really lovely day out there and you should go out and make the most of um, the, our amazing site. So um, thanks, Tom. Um, and there's, lot, uh, there's a really full activity of, pro, of program of, of activities on today and you need to get out there and make the most of the immersive experience here at CAT. So the Centre for Alternative Technology is a world-leading environmental charity, world-renowned eco-centre, one of the foremost providers of postgraduate sustainability education here in the UK. Our vision is a sustainable future for all humanity as part of a thriving natural world, and our mission is to inspire and inform and enable humanity to take action on the climate and biodiversity emergencies. Um, we were founded in 1973, it's our 50th birthday this year. Um, we've been, so we've been doing things differently here since 1973. Our founders had a vision to set up a community um, and a visitor centre to demonstrate to the public simpler, less damaging ways of living. Um, so in 1973, there was beginning to be so environmental awareness and concerns um, about limits to resources. There was publications of things like limits to resources, um, Schumacher's Small is Beautiful, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, and there was the kind of this growing environmental awareness. They, this site where we are is Slingwan Quarry, so when Wales was um, at the height of production of slate um, globally, it was a slate quarry. Um, it'd been abandoned for about two decades when we um, moved onto the site. Um, and it was volunteers originally, so probably like lots of you, like just organizing and um, worked, they worked really, really hard in pretty grim conditions. So you've seen already that it can rain quite a lot here. Um, it was really hard work in the early days working in, yeah, pretty like torrential rain to kind of re, um, refurbish um, and reimagine the building. So they worked, you know, the slate buildings, um, they, they effectively retrofitted them. And um, one of the amazing things about CAT is the regeneration of the quarry. So what was um, an industrial site, there's a fantastic picture on the outside of um, Tea Chest, one of the buildings on site, of what it looked like in 1973. It was kind of really barren, like lunar landscape. And we worked really, really hard over the last 50 years. Um, we compost all everything on site, and so we built up the earth and the soil, and the, the creation of productive organic vegetable gardens is one of the big successes, and then the creation of this amazing um, wildlife, ha thriving wildlife haven. So there's lots of species here on site that are rare species, rare moths, rare birds. Um, and yeah, it's been absolutely amazing that transformation of the quarry. Um, we've been pioneers of renewable technologies since 1973. So we um, installed the first hydro in 73, the first wind turbine in 75. 
the first completely solar heated building in the United Kingdom in 74, complete with uh, interseasonal heat store. Um, we published the first alternative energy strategy for the United Kingdom and handed it to Tony Benn, which nearly all of you in the room are far too young to know who he was, but anyway, handed it to Tony Benn as energy minister in 1977. Um, there's things in that that we wouldn't agree with now, but there's things in there like heat pumps. Um, so that was, you know, in 1977, we were already talking about heat pumps. It's not new technology, most of it. Um, it's about, you know, what we need is the political will um, and behavior change and at all levels. Um, so we've also got a long history of creativity and innovation on of spinning out sustainable businesses. Um, Dillis Engineering in Huntleth was founded here at CAT. Um, we've been really involved in community development, both here in Huntleth and, and in communities across the world. Um, and we erected the first community wind turbine here in Wales in 2003. Um, we are first zero, so Zero Carbon Britain is our kind of flagship research. Um, it's a model of how we can get to net zero here in the UK by 2050 or earlier using existing technology. We published the first Zero Carbon Britain report in 2007. So now governments, businesses, communities all over the world are all talking about net zero, how we can get to net zero. Back in 2007, no one was talking about it. So we were the first to start talking about that as well. I'm not going to talk too much about the problem because I think you already know it, but basically, you know, you're all really aware that climate change is causing widespread, rapid and intensifying um, changes across the globe, um, threatening lives, livelihoods and the wider natural world with the world's most vulnerable being most at risk. At 1.5 degrees of warming, um, we'll see increasing heat waves, longer warm seasons and shorter cold seasons. Two degrees would result in heat extremes that would more often reach critical tolerance thresholds um, for agriculture and health. Um, current policies presently in place around the world are projected to result in about 2.7 degrees of warming above pre-industrial levels. Um, so in terms of the solution, um, we need to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. And we need to do that in ways that create a healthier, safer, fairer, more sustainable world for all, and which ad address at the same time the widespread destruction of the natural environment and biodiversity loss. The 2020, this decade is absolutely critical. Um, and at the same time, we also need to adapt our infrastructure and ways of living to reduce the impacts of now unavoidable levels of climate change. And also, at the same time, support other communities around the world, recognizing our responsibilities as a long industrialized nation. It, it requires action at all levels. So it requires action from communities that, like yours, um, from individuals, from governments, and from businesses. Um, we've all got a part, our part to play in addressing the climate and biodiversity emergencies. So I said um, our Zero Carbon Britain is our like flagship research report. We published the first report in 2007. We've published subsequent reports since then. They're available in our shop. Um, basically, it's the, 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 the first part of it is about powering down. So powering down um, um, energy demand for, in buildings and from transport and from industry, and then powering up um, clean energy supplies from renewables. At the same time, transforming how, what we eat and how we use land. And at the same time, doing that in a way that provides multiple core benefits. So helping us to adapt to climate impacts, restoring biodiversity, improving public health, um, reducing fuel and, fuel and food poverty, and creating jobs and enhancing well-being. All of Kat's work here um, sits within that broad framework, focusing on the measures that are needed to accelerate the transformation, um, highlighting the most effective levers for change, and providing people with the skills, knowledge, and agency to play their part in building a better future for all humanity. So at CAT, we've got a graduate school. We've got eight different master's degrees in different sustainability subjects. So we started off with a master's in sustainable architecture um, over 20 years ago. 
We've now got architecture, green building, energy, food and land use, ecology, behaviour change, um, adaptation and research methods. So if any of you are interested in stu on studying on um, one of our master's programmes, Alice has got a stall out in the reception area with our prospectuses and can tell you, talk to you all about those um, masters. As well as masters, you can also do postgraduate diploma or a certificate and some modules you can kind of st uh, also study uh, as standalone modules as well. We've got over 700 master students studying with us currently, which makes us one, if not the biggest sustainability master's program in the UK. Uh, we've got students studying with us from all over the world. So at the moment, if you are elsewhere in the world, um, you can only study by distance learning, but we're going to be applying for a tier four license to bring international students to the UK in the next year or so. Um, we, so you can study either here at CAT or you can study uh, by distance learning or you can do a bit of both. Um, it's mod all modular, so you can decide if you want to study one module at CAT or, um, or from home. Um, they're accred currently accredited by Liverpool John Moores and the University of East London. Um, that's kind of historic. Start the whole thing started from a partnership with the University of East London. Um, we're looking at either going for full awarding pairs ourselves, so that we are full university, or going with a Welsh validating partner um, as part of our strategy. Our, um, our pedagogy, our, our whole kind of educational approach is unique. So it's um, innovative, creative, practical, hands-on, and holistic. So you can study architecture elsewhere in the United Kingdom. You can go right through your architecture training, your part one, your part two, your part three, and never actually build anything, which seems just completely bonkers. But if you come here to CAT, you basically get your hands dirty. So and that's the same whether you come on a short course or a degree course, and when you're here this weekend, um, it's very much about practical, hands-on um, activities. The architecture students do something called Build Week, and they build either buildings or structures here at CAT or out in communities. We do lots of community projects across Wales as well. Um, as well as the graduate school, we also have lots of vocational training, um, retrofitting skills, also sustainable woodland management, sustainable horticulture, renewables, um, and green building. Um, lots of short courses that you can come and study here. Um, the visitor centre is obviously a really important part of what we do. It's been going since um, 75. Uh, we bring lots of visiting school groups, university groups and organisations like Civic Square. Uh, over the last year that we've had lots of organisations like um, the Future Generations team, um, lots of different community organisations come for a really immersive experience. Um, I think that's what we can offer, what we do really well here. We also have a volunteering program. Some of you might be interested in that. So you can come and stay here um, for six months on site. We've got accommodation on site, really lovely accommodation on site. Um, and you can volunteer in our woodlands or gardens and get trained up in sustainable woodland management or sustainable horticulture. Um, and our volunteers go on to do amazing things. So, it, you know, it's about training up, training people in green skills, um, and they go on to fantastic, um, think, to do fantastic things. We've also got a free information service. If you've got any inquiries about anything to do with sustainability, there's uh, our information officers here on site, or you can email or call. And we've also got membership if you want to join and be part of the change. Um, our Zero Carbon Britain Hub and Innovation Lab um, runs um, carbon literacy training for councils and communities across the United Kingdom. We've trained more than half of the councils in the UK in the last year. Um, and our innovation lab um, uses systems thinking and design thinking and co-creative practice to look at bringing communities together to look at what are the barriers to action on climate change um, and to prototype solutions so um, we've got exciting plans to, to continue to develop what we do, um, to, re to continue to regenerate the visitor centre and as both as a visitor centre and sustainable skills hub, um, and to continue to work in partnership with organisations like Civic Square and, and other, we're really keen on working in partnerships and I know that I've talked with some of you in the room about opportunities to work together. 
Um, so that's it. So it's just like, enjoy your day, the rest of your day. I hope you enjoy your time here at CAT. I'm around for a bit if you want to come and talk to me about anything. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, Eileen. Um, we're really grateful to be here. It's really given us, over the last couple of years, a lot of opportunities for our community, our neighbours, our team, um, other partners we work with to learn practical skills, to imagine what would be possible in bringing some of the incredible um, resources that are here in a rural location into the heart of the inner city. Um, and I hope that over the next like, day, you're able, also able to think about what that might mean um, for the communities you work with or um, the work that you would like to do. So yeah, please do go and chat to um, Eileen or any of the CAT practitioners. They've got such a rich and deep knowledge of um, the local uh, ecology and it's really quite uh, profound. Um, some of that is available on the organised walks as well. So we're going to wrap up this session. Before we wrap up, I'm going to just ask uh, Sarah, who's another organising partner, to just share a little bit about um, why she's here um, in her many hats, but also some of the things she's hosting today. And then um, one of the speakers for the next session, unfortunately, couldn't make it due to the weather. So we're going to start half an hour later. So you've got a little bit of a moment to move around. Um, and then there'll be, um, you'll be hearing from Abdi, from Coffee Afrique, uh, Kwejo, who's an incredible uh, activist and organiser. Some of you might have seen his TikToks and his Instagrams um, of holding councils and the state to account, particularly and social housing providers for the state of, uh, the criminal state of some people's homes. Um, and he's just, both of them are just an absolute delight. So come back in here later for um, a conversation. We'll see how many people there are and we'll see whether maybe we move somewhere outside if people are like, oh, we do not want to sit in the hall any longer, but uh, it will be in here. Uh, but now I'm just going to pass over to Sarah to just share a little bit about um, her role as a co-organiser and then this session will cl come to a close. Thanks. I won't keep you long, but I think it worked really well yesterday when we told everybody a little bit about what's also on offer in the afternoon. So, yeah, my name is Sarah. Um, I'm here in a couple of capacities, but basically as a um, committed person to this retrofit reimagined movement. Um, one of the roles I hold is I share a job with Rachel over there. We're co-directors of the National Retrofit Hub. Um, so yesterday we did a bit of a discussion around leveraging the built environment and more of that will happen today where we're sort of talking about what we understand to be straight up and down built environment stuff but actually how we start to expand the thinking in the built environment so there's a really interesting conversation later on um, about disrupting disrupting architectural education and um, so there's that's I think going to happen in the Brook Trust room upstairs but generally Outside the door here, there's a notice board where you can see the description of the different sessions that are on. Um, and you can sign up to that and you can attend that. If you don't really know what all of them are, just ask somebody next to you. We have, um, there's, a, there's quite a number of outdoor things happening. So walks, uh, workshops, there's at the moment, there's a rammed earth workshop going on. There are several straw bale construction workshops. Me and Ricky found ourselves in that didn't we? yesterday, accidentally. It was a joy. Um, and yeah, so there's, um, there's so the details out there, if you want to know more, do have a chat with us about that. Um, and just ask people, I think it's a bit hard to imagine sometimes from a little title what that event is. Um, but we will have one of all of the different organizing team members. One of those will be in each of those sessions to help you navigate your way a little bit more. Um, but yeah, if you do end up in a session and there's only two or three of you in there, as Amy suggested, it's been a really lovely day outside and people, I think, want to make the most of being out there. Just go together. Go outside. Have your conversation as you walk. It's really beautiful out there. And it, look at that. Look, there's a blue sky up there. <laughs> um, so enjoy the rest of the day and just shout, ask anybody. Everybody's really happy to help and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. And I can't wait to see Quaid. I'm so happy you're here. <laughs> I know where I'm going to be. Um, okay, see you all later. Have a good day. Thank you.
afternoon, everyone. I was about to say morning, but we're now two minutes into the afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, there is a wealth of activity happening outside, um, and we know uh, people are also like, I don't want to be inside in my few hours in Wales where the weather is good. Um, so uh, we are definitely going to do the provocations inside because there's a lovely live stream and um, really, really important that we share uh, and uh, capture some of the talks that are happening in this moment. Um, I remember the late, great David Graeber, uh, I think about six months before he uh, passed away tragically in COVID, uh, after he'd written uh, the book, uh, there's no kids in here, Bullshit Jobs, um, he'd, people kept inviting him to come and do talks. And he's like, I've said everything I've said in the book and in all the talks I've done. Um, and you, like, here's some videos you can replay. And I, I've read about this, this story and his partner wrote about this um, recently because after he passed, a whole range of people had collected the best of his work and his quotes and b built them into events. And it just made me think about how much labor um, it takes to tell the story of your work over and over again and how important that is. Um, but also like the responsibility we have to like capture and record and use, utilize things um, because a lot of the people you're hearing from in the whole of this festival aren't just theorists who are writing books or writing blogs or producing frameworks. They're actually people that are trying to, in many ways, uh, both uh, make that practical on the ground, but also for many people, their work actually starts from deep, deep being in relationship and in community uh, whether that's in an emergency, in mutual aid, in crisis, or in more of the more propositional work about the future in places and neighborhoods. Um, so when I was like, should we just scrap the live stream and go outside? I was like, oh no, we shouldn't because it is important that we capture things um, so that you can use them in, with respect and reference in your neighborhoods and communities. So that's why uh, I think it's really important to be in. But after we've done the provocations, if the temperature check is, let's go to the pavilion outside next to the water, we can move the convo there and have a more of an in, in conversation. So I'm really delighted. Uh, I'm really excited about the session. Very, very grateful for the travel that everybody has done to get here. Um, and this session really focuses on two uh, practitioners and visionaries and activists and souls that I think have contributed so much um, in the last few years and in, in their work to our understanding of um, both the lived experience and reality of, of people that are often like a little blob, like that slide you saw this morning that said underperforming housing. Like that's how uh, those things get described in a, in a, a system sense. But uh, when we're understanding this from uh, the perspective of uh, people, uh, kin and neighbors, these can be devastating realities for people. And so this session this morning, uh, we'll hear from Kwejo who has done uh, amazing work in uh, beginning to socialize and raise awareness um, to the, uh, the deep issues that, rely, uh, that are happening within our country, particularly um, starting that work from his own experience. And we're very grateful how often he shares such uh, a difficult part of, of his own life uh, with us all. So um, I'm very, very grateful for that in advance. And uh, from Abdi, who is doing just incredibly profound work um, at a neighborhood scale, both um, being able to understand like mutual aid and being in community and the, the, what it means for us to support and nurture our communities in their reality today, but also about how you can connect that to bold visions. Um, and he's just one of those people that, like if you follow him on Twitter, for example, uh, basically bo you should follow both of them on social media because that's how I uh, came to know of, of them, um, they're, they're both really prolific on social media, but Abdi is someone that I just feel is, his soul is so beautiful and the way he weaves connections across so many organizations and so many uh, different people, but then brings that back to really stunning work in Tower Hamlets and beyond is, is profound. We programmed this session to hopefully help you to be able to see your own power uh, within where you live, within 
where your starting points are within your cultural context, within perhaps the people and the communities that, whose voices you aren't hearing or you're not traveling to or you're not being part of in your own place. Um, and throughout the afternoon, there's a number of other things that you can then go to if you're like, yeah, I'm pretty ready to do something with this. So there's a neighborhood organizing session. Abdi and Kweja are with us for a few hours, um, so you can talk to them more. Um, I've just seen John walk in, who's been organizing in Borsal Heath through the, the lens of uh, the different connection points they have in Borsal Heath as a really revolutionary neighborhood in Birmingham. But one particular point is how the faith communities in Borsal Heath are organized. And so how so much of Borsal Heath retro retrofits work has come from um, knowing, uh, going to those existing places and forging collaborations across um, the Quaker communities, the, uh, the mosques, the churches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's so many different starting points. And again, this session is about like learning more about that. Um, I'm very grateful for you both being here. I really, really am. And I heard that we've just managed to get you to come to Glasgow as well. So, well, well hey. By the way, everyone at this stage, I don't know if you get this sense in the team, right? Like, there's this kind of real completing all the all the stages of retrofit reimagined there's like a, a special medal if you were also in the field last year and you make it to all five sites which i might be about to do god willing if i make it to glasgow so this is also an invitation to all of you uh, you might as well just come to glasgow get in on the access fund yeah yeah you get in on the access fund give us a bit of a heads up so we can have a bit of time to sort out your travel but uh, let's all go up there because these folks are coming now as well um so it's a delight to welcome uh, well, I'll welcome Abdi up first, uh, and then Kwejo, um, and they'll give you a short provocation intro to their work. Um, we may then stay inside. We may also go to this beautiful spot that you guys might not have found at Cat yet uh, for a bit of the in convo. Um, but we'll, we'll do a temperature check after the first half and 40 minutes, um, if that's okay. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And um, Abdi, would you like to come down first? <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you so much for that uh, kind introduction, Emmy. I really appreciate it and the, and the love and care that you have through all of your work and to your amazing team and the team, uh, your collective, who are doing so much to provide uh, reimagined futures for us or um, ideas that don't exist at the moment that are hard to, to fathom. My name is um, Abdurrahim Hassan. I am originally from a place called Somaliland, which is the uh, north of Somalia. It's an autonomous region, which is an independent region. And I think the best way to describe my people is that we are people of the land. We uh, have this belief that land and buildings and structures and space have rights over us. And then it's critical for us to understand that from a spiritual perspective too. And why uh, so many of our stories, our indigenous stories are critical that we capture is because we understand how important it provides or how land especially provides and buildings provide healing for marginalized communities who are especially traumatized. And so my experience started at seven years old actually in, in London. And it was the first time that I can remember um, injustice. Um, I'm from an area called Tower Hamlets, which is one of the poorest parts of London. Um, in the estate that I grew up in, uh, just before the Blackwell Tunnel, uh, the children who live still in that estate where my mum lives have 10% reduced lung capacity because of the Black Hole Tunnel. So we came up through that, and that was my first kind of connection to um, how toxic air and uh, areas that are dense or concrete jungles, if not regenerative or not designed in a way that is rooted in healing or liberation, can actually kill you, literally kill you. And amongst the groups that I grew up with, the 15 boys that I can remember, there are some that no longer um, are with us today. Their spirits exist, but not with us today because of all sorts of complex reasons. When you have um, areas that are rooted in poverty that don't have um, hope or, or options. And the seven-year-old me remembers um, really poor health within the community and that we were so far removed from understanding what 
healing looks like, but for, particularly from a, a land perspective. And my dad, who was a seafarer, he came to the UK at, in 1945, his past now, he would say to me, never forget the motherland. And that never um, clicked with me at, at that age. So fast forward a few years um, into teenager, hood and it became clear to me that perhaps it's my autism but it became clear to me that there were pockets of spaces just abandoned spaces as i'd leave mum's home and go to the rubbish chute and then go to the local shop just corners and edges and places that really you could do some magic with or engineered magic and there's an incredible nigerian author called chimamande Ngozi, and she speaks on this idea of paradise land right and although i didn't understand what those bare places could look like, we, um, myself and one of my best friends, uh, we decided to build our first, at that time, what I think now you could call a community garden. So at 16 years old, we reclaimed a small piece of land near my mum's uh, hood, and we were able to recruit other local teenagers, and we started planting I'm mainly planting just to get away from the space uh, with only one bus and one GP and the kind of like dense feeling that we were locked in. And that grew into other um, community ideas, including walking trips that we were able to do, but actually the walking trip was in a rubbish chute. It was, it was where the main recycling and waste would go to. So we would jump over the gate and we would just go around and find um, treasures amongst um, that space. And all of this kind of inspired me to always never forget, firstly, where you're from, but also to regenerate hyperlocally. And so I went to LSE, I studied economics, and I left feeling really disenfranchised, actually, not really uh, wanting to join corporate, but sadly I did. And this idea that you can really do so much for your community from a solidarity economics perspective, and how do you regenerate the hood? So I speak about the hood a lot uh, in my practice at the moment. And a few years ago, I set up an organization called Coffee Afrique with Community. We're a co-op based organization, and now working across seven hubs in London, specifically in Tower Hamlets and Hackney. And each of those uh, hubs have specific themes but really very much rooted in community wealth building because it's so important um, for my side that we provide uh, community wealth building principles that also look at place making that look at nature and climate but to me I think the sense of urgency that we have as an organization is how do you build traditional ecological knowledges how do you build knowledge but from an indigenous perspective from a marginalized or black community perspective how do you encourage um, marginalized communities to grow and to prosper and to thrive and what does our chemical resilience look like in our poorer communities and so to me I love theory and I, I love books and I love reading but it's so important that we do things in this kind of moment of poly crisis and multiple crisis in a practical way and Imi said earlier about this concept of just starting small starting small hyper locally is really personal to me so when I'm walking still at the moment across the seven hubs I'm still seeing an empty bench that's abandoned or a corner shop that's abandoned or a piece of land that needs attention and part of the work we, we are always doing um, is looking at how we can regenerate those spaces so we now have these seven hubs two women's co-ops uh, two tech hubs which are rooted in the community wealth building very much inspired by Kate's work and other practitioners like um, a good friend of mine called Nabil, who wrote Privatize the Mandem, which is about understanding streets and, and understanding Section 106 and seal money and where money flows, for example. But those hubs now have 17 different projects that are really very much focused on empowering communities, but an embodied way. And how does that um, appear for us? It means um, empowering communities through knowledge. So we have different practitioners like our good friends at Centric Lab who are cre creating a, a model called Walid Empowerment Hub. And Walid in my culture is elder. So it's about empowering elders to pass on knowledge to younger generations, so intergenerational work. One of the other hubs is currently developing a piece of land and how we regenerate that land from a retrofit perspective, but also how do we own so that land is passed on seven generations ahead. How do we also work with our young black men in our tech hub in Second Home in Brick Lane or just off Brick Lane? 
And we do that through actually a trip that was funded by Lankali Chase a couple of years ago. We went to Copenhagen to um, try to immerse ourselves in a practical way to understand donut economics, but also understand cake work and practice in citation practice in this moment. And so much of this knowledge about how do you build wealth in communities, but also see the entire sphere of community empowerment and development as far as nature is concerned, housing is concerned, as far as your, your physical health, your somatic health, and, and that, that hub now is a thriving space because the, the boys have been able to develop uh, three different enterprises, a barbershop, a mental health space that's rooted in traditional knowledge, and also a, a reseller. They sell trainers like this um, at a higher margin online. And the whole idea is to just continue to build in a space that normally wouldn't be accessible for people that look like me, but also to build in a space that, as I said, is rooted in solidarity economics. And that now is, um, is trickling into community from, from, a, from a health perspective. So the other hubs are rooted in problematic drug support. It's rooted in uh, elders. We, we build community gardens and have four five soon, inshallah, that we are um, building in the hood. And what that looks like in a practical way, again, from a rebuilding or reimagining perspective, is designing spaces that look like us, and I, if I, my mind is right, James Baldwin spoke on this, that um, when, when I see you, you see me eff effectively. And also uh, the concept of Ubuntu across these gardens. So they're called Ubuntu gardens. I am because we are. And we use the food now from these gardens to, to cook in our community kitchens. And one of the key elements of our work is, is in food justice. So we eat together at a, a, on a daily basis. Uh, I often travel across the seven hubs and we eat together, we pray together, we dance together, we, we have art therapy together, and we use a Western clinical ideology, but also, as I said earlier, African indigenous practice. This um, work that Civic Square are doing is so important, um, in my view, and, and critical in this moment, because so much of the clients, the 892 people we cared for and supported last month, are in deep crisis at the moment, and multiple crises, not just in housing, but in almost every single area, for all sorts of complex reasons, but because, mainly because of this government. But the challenge that we have is how do we uh, come from a place of empowerment and not scarcity and how do we develop the hubs so that uh, they're truly thriving and how do we exchange ideas with other communities and how do we increase um, our knowledge and how do we share that knowledge with the, the global south and finally one of the, the other key elements as part of our practice is um, uh, the same young black men that I was mentioning were able to receive a micro grant recently and they've just purchased a piece of land in Devon which, which, was, which is a good piece of land in terms of value, only £6,000 but for an auction and the next step for them is to build a space in the countryside that is rooted in healing, particularly for young black men and people who have left um, prisons and ex-offenders. But fundamentally for me, it is, as I started earlier, about this idea that we root ourselves back in the land. And I passionately believe that we have become more and more dysregulated because we have moved from, and also for all sorts of reasons um, that I won't go into in this moment, we've moved from the power and beauty of our traditional ecological knowledges and our traditional knowledge and it is for me incumbent to be able to pass on as an older person now to the young people that we root ourselves back in the land and the way the land speaks and the way it speaks to you and the way you build on the land and the way that the land can nurture you and the way it nurtures itself and we, if we use, uh, whether we use community wealth building principles or we use um, public health principles to me this is about saving lives ultimately from a liberatory harm perspective so in summary that is um, the work we're doing we're rooted in activism have been doing this for 20 years but it's it's, it's for us at, uh, now much more about how we how we return to the land and that's our theme for the next year as an organization too i think i maybe have gone over my time i was going to show a video um, yeah, so um, if you can press a play on that video, friend.
alaikum. My name is Abdi Hassan, the founder of Coffee Afrique. We started the organization in 2018, focused on building hubs across five London boroughs. Imagine you bring a group together, a group of five kids that all have the same goal in mind. That ultimately drives the whole, the whole, the whole group to do well. So at the end of it, the whole group will achieve a star and eight. So I thought that's a very, very important point. Bring people that have like-minded goals into this space and they can work towards their organization and goals. I was inspired by this man. I was inspired by what you did in the fire here at the other side. Come down, meet the boys, and like hear what we're doing. So that's why I came to it. It's really good to hear about what you have been up to. Those hubs are centered on indigenous wisdom and practice honouring people, meeting them where they are, using co-op models that are about regeneration and less about extraction. Our work is focused on deep healing and liberation. Our young black men, as an example, in Tower Hamlets and the hub itself is very much focused on showing them that love is possible in a space that also encourages business enterprise our women in Hackney run a hub that is focused on a co-op model, and that co-op model is centred on rooted advocacy, good food, a community garden, and also just joyful fun. It's very important as Muslims to also centre our work on Islam, and that means we practise deep faith and deep spirit-based interventions, which include individual therapy, group therapies, but also giving back to community and rooted in neighborhoods and estates. Practicing sabr, which is patience, in all the work that we do. It is also about seeing and recognizing that there is a higher power in all of our work. We practice tawakkul, and that is an absolute belief in God's plan for all of the work that we do. We're very grateful for being able to serve the community, and that includes several thousand since our inception. In fact, 6,877 just through the years of the pandemic. Assalamu alaikum, my name is Mukhtar. I'm one of the co-founders here at Coffee Afrique. As someone with lived experience, I'm extremely passionate about tackling the long-standing issues that impact our societies on a regular basis. Some of the work that I've been doing recently is in partnership with Public Health England, which looked at supporting marginalised groups in Tower Hamlets with mental health support. We actually incorporated Islamic theology and organised a peer-to-peer -peer support group for women. We combined the traditional topics around mental health with Islam and the impact that we saw over six months was extremely transformative. Space <laughs> We got the Mesha Law and Blab and Nine and Dakatola. We had Nagamagam and Odonaha exercise in Asamena one day. In Tasan Hotan of Sokodina, we had Alhamdulla, Rancho and Hisana, Michina do one Hisana, Hadid Makamela Lola, Hablano, Obahana in Tasan, Maka in Tasan Hadda, Ogahe. Our 
I do this work mainly because growing up, I've seen a lot of my friends, Smiley in particularly, that have indulged in substance that obviously didn't get that sort of help to at least go to this place and obviously seek some sort of help. A helping hand would be great. Someone to at least show some sort of walks of life and give you sort of a, a helping hand. So where do people go when they take their substances? Uh, local stakeholders, that, such as 24-hour casinos or 24-hour shops, asking them where's the hidden spots where particular people that probably might be indulged in substance misuse may go to. And hopefully just low-key, just go there and just at least see what's happening. What makes me happy, to be honest with you, is someone that's actually gone through the rehabilitation processes and actually changed and to become what they wanted to become. Thank you so much, Abdi. Um, Kwejo, would you like to come straight up? I don't know how I follow that up. That was amazing. That was absolutely amazing. <laughs> it's great to be um, back with Retrofit Reimagined. And thank you to Civic Square for inviting me back again for a third time. Third time? Yes, it is a third time. Um, these conversations are so, so important. And I feel like with every event that I've come to, I've learned new things and just why it is so important for us to be having these conversations. We have to be reimagining what our future is going to be like, what it has to be like, the change that we need to make now, because what we can't be ignorant to is the sort of impending crisis that we're seeing and we can expect to happen, whether that be climate change, the housing crisis, NHS, you name it. And we can't be ignorant to the fact that we have to create that change for future generations too. Um, we have a duty, I think. We should feel compelled to do that. So by having these conversations, not only are we admitting that there's problems across the board, but we are actively trying to think of solutions in order to address these issues, not just for us, but future generations too. So my name is Kwejo Tuanabawa, and I am a uh, social housing campaigner, but I campaign in regards to all housing. Um, and I started off uh, campaigning three years ago and I was sort of given the title. I, I never went out, I never <laughs> woke up one day and thought, you know what, I'm going to be a campaigner. Um, and I was living in, so I've lived in social housing for the majority of my, my life. Um, really poor social housing, to say, to say the least. I think um, when I was in, I'd say, heading into sixth forms, things got quite bad. Um, we were made homeless as a family and I was studying my A-levels, my younger sister was studying her GCSEs and we were told we had two options and that was to either move to Luton, bearing in mind we had been born in South London, always grown up in South London, never really travelled anywhere around the country um, other than within London um, and we were given that choice, well my dad was given that choice and or it was either stay in temporary accommodation in London. So with the circumstances, um, my dad made that decision to stay in temporary accommodation. There's nothing temporary about temporary accommodation here in the UK, can tell you that for free. Um, but it happened to be a converted car garage that we were having to stay in. And I mean, when I say converted car garage, it still had the garage door on and it was so poorly converted. It had damp head mold growing in it. And it was me and my sisters, basically adults, having to, to share a bed together while studying for some of the, our biggest exams, um, education-wise. And we were in there for, for a few years. And I remember the time that we were there because it, I remember waking up one day and going into, you can't really call it a room, but my dad's room. And he had fallen asleep with the TV on. And it was the news because he loved watching BBC News. And it was aerial shots of the Grenfell fire. And um, I remember standing there and watching it, not really taking into consideration what it was that I was looking at at the time. And I saw a building on fire and I thought, oh, how horrible. And it wasn't until the penny dropped and I realized people had, had been trapped in there overnight. And then they started playing back 
the archive footage that people had taken on their phone and the sheer panic and chaos that happened, the, the tragedy that happened that night. And I remember thinking, us people in social housing that live in social housing, it's not the fact that it's just me and my family that are struggling at the moment, having to live in a garage and, and, and sort of treated quite rubbishly by those in charge and those in, in power and often dictated to. It wasn't just us, there were others. And I think Grenfell was a, a prime representation and I think a damning indictment of what had been allowed to happen for so long towards social housing tenants that happened to be of a certain class here in the UK. And a few, as I say, a year or two afterwards, we moved into our, well, actually it was a year later, 2018, um, we moved into our permanent social housing. It was on an estate in South London in Mitcham, and it's called the Eastfields Estate, but it was absolutely falling to bits. I mean, the estate was put up in about the 60s or 70s, and we moved into a home that was filled with cockroaches, mice, damp mold. We had lights filled with rainwater whenever it rained. We had a kitchen that was near, nearly 100 years old, and I mean, the worktop so damp that you could have put your hand straight through it. Uh, poor security to the house, and we had been complaining about everything, but my dad felt compelled to take it because uh, what would have happened if he didn't take it was he would have been told he would be making himself intentionally homeless, and as a result, the housing provider no longer had to provide assistance to me or my family, so he had to take it, and it's very similar with loads of um, tenants on the social housing waiting list uh, or those living in social housing where they're moved into to disrepair, effectively. Uh, my dad became ill, in January 2020, he was diagnosed with stage one esophageal cancer. And we had, I think, me and my sisters were quite lucky because by that point I was about 20, 21, and we, we didn't know what death was. We had never experienced anyone becoming ill or passing away around us. We didn't know what the feeling of grief was like or what to expect with it. But then it all came like a, a ton of bricks when my dad um, b became ill. And uh, often we'd watch, I remember I'd watch anyway, I can speak on behalf of myself, shows like um, children in need and stand up to cancer and you would hear the absolutely horrific stories um, and it would be really upsetting even though we hadn't experienced that close to us but at the back of my mind was always that thought that oh it happens to everyone else but it wouldn't happen to us it wouldn't it wouldn't happen to i can't ever imagine it happened to my mum and dad no one ever wants to imagine that happened to a family member let alone a parent and then it did and I was studying at uni, at uni at the time, and I remember my dad phoning me, and I knew something was up weeks before, but I remember him telling me that he's been told he has cancer. And I, didn't, I was very naive to the form of cancer, didn't know how aggressive it was, and I thought, okay, it's early, stage one, you'll be, you'll, you'll be fine. Um, and I remember my friends telling me, oh, um, I'm so sorry to hear that your dad's got cancer, and I would sort of not laugh it off, but be like, it's fine, like, he's found it early, like, there's nothing to be feeling sad about. But it progressed pretty rapidly in the space of a year. And in a few months, he went from walking around and, and eating and drinking to not, no longer being able to swallow his saliva, eat, drink, because the tumour was in his throat. And he lost, so he, he was smaller than my younger sister. And he was bed bound at that point. And, and it just, he, de he deteriorated quite rapidly. And again, he was in those sorts of conditions being fed through dip by district nurses three times a day. And they were horrified by the conditions he was living in. We explained to them we had been complaining, but we weren't being listened to. And he became our priority. And then um, in, I'd say, November, my sister found him having a fit in his hospital bed. She woke up and we, he was unresponsive. We took him to hospital and they had found a mass on his brain. And we thought the tumor and cancer had spread. Um, but it wasn't, it was an infection. And his tube in his stomach had fallen out in the house a few weeks before. Um, what that meant is he had to have brain surgery, and he was due to have the tumour removed two weeks later had he not had to have that brain surgery. But as a result, um, he, was, he was no longer fit enough to go through two major surgeries because he would have died, is what they said. So as a result, that was almost his death sentence. And he passed away in January 2020, and um, things went from bad to worse. On the day of his funeral, we had a ceiling directly above where his hospital where, uh, bed was in the front room. It collapsed because of a leak. And that was in February 2020. No one from housing came out until October that same year. And then when they did come out, they pulled the ceiling down, didn't tell anyone it contained asbestos and left dust everywhere. And on top of that, the ceiling wasn't then put up until uh, January the following year. So I remember asking, are we going to have a ceiling for Christmas? And they turned around and said, no, we've only got two people and both of them are fully booked until next year. So we had beams in our front room and day, you could see daylight through the brickwork. But I mean, it was absolutely slum conditions. We had a workman come in and describe it as not even fit for animals to live in. But a few months ago, my dad was receiving treatment and cancer treatment, chemotherapy and those conditions. 
Um, and it got to a point where I was depressed. I was very suicidal because of it. And um, I remember one day phoning them and they had promised they'd come out. And it got eight to eight o'clock, nine o'clock. I was at work, working in a school and they, they just didn't come out. Um, I, I phoned them and they turned around very dismissive on the phone and said, um, we're really busy, we can't come out and hung the phone up. At that point, I said that was enough. I took pictures and videos of the inside of my home and uploaded it to social media. It went completely viral. Um, the local news picked it up, and then I went. They turned around and said, "We're sorry that Quajo feels as though him and his family haven't received the service they deserve," and that really angered me. So I knocked on every single home on my estate, 500 plus homes, went into the homes, and people living in equally as bad, if not worse, conditions. One woman, 27 years, was living with disrepair. Um, another student was during lockdown. Um, he was online learning. He's a student from my school, and the ceiling collapsed next to him as he was in the middle of a lesson um, because of a leak that they had been complaining about. And there was another a young girl. She went to my school too, and um, she had three brain tumors and was recovering from that, receiving chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Um, her home was in disrepair. At one point, her mum was told to sleep in the bath because um, they couldn't come out and fix the work that they were supposed to do. Um, she was also, the toilet was broken and she was receiving cancer treatment and you, you, you go toilet a lot because you're told to drink a lot of water. So she was going toilet during the night and having to put her hand down the back of the toilet in the cistern to pull the chain because the toilet wouldn't work and they wouldn't come out and fix it. And that's how dire the situation was. And anyway, ITV came down and done an undercover two week investigation and I'm still, I know Abdi knows Sarah and I'm still very much best friends with her. We stayed friends ever since. But that was the change for me and the turning point because before that I felt so small and it wasn't until ITV came down and sent in a right of reply to my housing provider, my chief house, the chief executive, that's on half a million per year, and um, that they finally actually listened and responded. And it felt like I was finally on their level and could have a conversation and treat with some sort of respect. Um, anyway, they were disgraced nationally into carrying out works. So they had to spend around 20 million pounds in my area alone, but I knew things were much worse around the country. I couldn't just pull up the ladder up behind me. It couldn't have just been my estate falling to bits, and it wasn't, it was my whole borough. And then I learned it was the whole country. And I spent the last few years traveling the country, going into people's homes, filming, uploading it to social media, going on to the likes of Good Morning Britain, ITV News, BBC News, taking these stories on there in order to disgrace these social housing providers that aren't doing their job and failing their tenants. And what angered me most was we're six and a half years on since Grenfell. And that should have been the learning curve. But what I knew was it absolutely wasn't. People were still living in slum housing and complaining of similar situations and treatments that those residents were complaining of before the night of Grenfell. And not only that, since then, we've had the death of Al Vishak, the young boy that died in 2020, a year before my dad. Um, sorry, a few months after my dad. He, he, he died in, died in uh, December 2020, living in a home filled with damp and mold. His parents had been complaining since before he was born. He died at the age of two, and they found uh, mold in his lungs and in his blood, traces of mold in his lungs and in his blood. He dies as a result of that. So um, what I learned was people were actually dying as a result of the poor conditions they were being subject to, through no fault of their own. They happened to be a, so a certain class and living in social housing. And um, what I wanted to do was create absolute change. I knew the state of housing, and housing was something that hadn't been prioritized in this country for a very long time. Or when it was, it was for political football and political, ga political gain, and the wrong things were being promised, like this whole idea of home ownership, home ownership, home ownership that's even been pushed now. But what they weren't looking at was the fact people were dying in social housing. The fact that we have 1.4 million people waiting to get into social housing. The fact we currently have 131,000 homeless kids in England alone. The fact that we have some of the highest rents we've ever had on record in the private rental sector. The fact that every eight minutes, a family is handed a Section 21 no-fault eviction across England, rendering them homeless. These were the issues that they weren't paying attention to, the, the, the issues that were affecting people's lives. The fact that kids can't study and go to school and get a decent education because they have nowhere to call home after school. And I was very much that. We were having to stay at one point in, you, you guys will know the big yellow storage, there was a point we were homeless and we happened to go home after school. That was, that's what we called home. We were sleeping on top of furniture in a storage unit because the council wouldn't help us. And things are much worse than what they were in 2013. Yet these are the issues that politicians and the people in charge are failing to pay attention to. And that's why I was so angry. And I mean, I'm just a guy from South London, off of an estate. I was 23, 22 when I started campaigning. My dad passed away when I was 21. But I was very, very determined. And the reason that I found myself here now and being able to sit in rooms with politicians, those in charge of housing for the whole, whole country, isn't because I have a degree in housing or I have any sort of education within housing, but it was because I cared fundamentally and because I had lived experience. And I think that speaks f way more than uh, 
any sort of degree or, or, or theoretical learning that you could do based on these subjects is being is having lived experience and as a result tragically having to suffer and I wanted to make sure other families weren't having to go through what me and my family had to go to go through if I could help one family um, and, and, and a young child especially not have to go through that through their education not have to have their childhood robbed of them because of the conditions that they're having to live in, the stress that parents are put under, the fact that people have to give up university and their jobs because they become so stressed at their living conditions and their mental health falls apart. The fact that kids can't get a decent level of education who are already from disadvantaged backgrounds as it is because they are living in social housing. These are the real life impacts that the roof over your head and having a decent and safe roof over your head has over the rest of your life and your, the future of your kids too. But there was a failure of consensus and understanding by those in charge. And that was because they simply didn't understand what that was like. They didn't have the lived experience. And that's why I come here today. That's why I go around the country and I engage in these conversations because housing, if you suggest talking about housing, a lot of people will think it's a boring subject, but it's not when you realize it impacts people's lives and people are dying as a result of not having access to decent housing, the fact that we've got record levels of rough sleepers, record levels of hidden homeless individuals, but there's no acknowledgement of that. We're the sixth richest economy in the world, yet we struggle to, 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 to be able to provide a roof over the heads of some of the most vulnerable people in the country. We see housing as more of an asset or an accumulation of wealth than the necessity that it is. We don't see it as important as the need for food and water when Maslow's hierarchy of needs states that basic shelter is something we all require to function as a human being. And it's because we become lost in that way. And we look at countries like Vienna, for example, who have expanded their social housing and doing quite well. They do have their flaws, of course. You look at Germany and their private rented sector and people are happy to privately rent out there. Yet in this country, it seems to be a bit of a free-for-all between the haves and the have-nots. And if you're not a have if you're a have-not, you're being dictated to by the, one, the people that have money and have influence and own, the home, own all of these homes. I'll give you one statistic, actually, a fact that I learned pretty recently. Um, you guys will know of the Right to Buy scheme, um, and I'm a social housing campaigner, but I also campaign against the Right to Buy scheme because I think it's absolutely flawed, and we've lost two million homes over the last um, few decades since the Right to Buy scheme began and we can't talk about fixing social housing without we can't talk about in, we can't talk about fixing social housing but in the same sentence talk about continuing the right to buy scheme and hemorrhaging off the little stock of social homes that we have yes 2 million working class individuals or 2 million working class families had the opportunity to buy their own home but at what cost we now have 1.4 million working class individuals who are currently waiting to get into social housing we've got 101,000 131,000 homeless kids in England alone. We've got a private rented sector that's completely on its knees and putting more pressure onto social housing that we simply don't have. We've got thousands of people showing up to local authority councils, declaring themselves homeless on a weekly basis. That's being put in hotels if they're lucky, but they're moved every 28 days as a result because there simply isn't enough space for them. This is all the suffering that is, it, it, it has caused. And the reason I really, really dislike um, the right to buy scheme is because what we're saying, again, is housing um, and social housing is, it should be treated as an asset, not a necessity, not needed for the, the vulnerable people in British society. But that statistic I was talking about, um, the, the housing minister under Margaret Thatcher when the right to buy scheme was introduced, turns out that his son, it was announced in 2013, owns, and he probably owns more, more than 40 ex-council properties on a single estate in South London. And that was back in 2013. There's some estates in London where one individual owns 95 plus ex-council properties on estates. That shouldn't happen. So we need to be talking about housing. We need to be talking about building more housing. But we need to also be talking about the housing that we got or that, that we have at the moment and the way, to, the way in which it is distributed and being distributed unfairly if we're going to address this housing crisis. But we also need to be touching upon subjects like climate, because what we know is things are only gonna get worse. My inbox is filled up with residents complaining time and time again on a daily basis about the conditions they're having to live in. What shocked me was last year, 
during some of the hottest days, I think the hottest days on record actually this country has seen, 40 degrees, I was receiving messages no longer about leaks and cockroaches and mice and those things, sorts of things, but from residents living in high rises that were absolutely boiling in their homes because of how hot it was on these days and they were really struggling with their kids. It meant that individuals were having to purchase fans and mini air conditioning units to send out to some of these families. We couldn't send it to all of them, but to some of them to try and help. And we talk about climate change, and yes, we need to insulate homes, but also what we need to be focusing on too is what happens during extreme weather in the summertime and homes are 40 degrees plus, people are struggling in their homes. How are we going to help them? This consensus that we need to knock up as many homes as possible to meet government targets is a mistake that governments have made for generations. And what they've done is by trying to meet these targets, they've sacrificed quality and need for those that are living in the homes. Yes, we need more homes, but we need more quality, safe homes. We need homes that are practical for people to live in. The fact that in the 60s and 70s we were building tower blocks and now we have council staff, housing association staff, telling people living in high rises, you can't dry your clothes indoors because you're causing your damper mold, but also you can't dry it on your balcony because it's an eyesore for your neighbors, but they haven't built this property with any sort of air conditioning, um, not air conditioning, drying unit or anything for these families to actually dry their clothes in. This is what I mean when I say we need to be building homes practically with the people that are going to be living in these homes in mind. And yes, it will cost money, but what I can tell you is if the government don't, doesn't address this issue of housing, which is probably one of the biggest issues in this house, uh, in this country at the moment, because it affects everyone, whether you are a rough sleeper or whether you own your own home. If they don't deal with it now, it's going to be much worse in 15, 20 years um, time from now when we are really feeling the effects and the really bad effects and consequences of climate change. Or when our social housing waiting list grows, as predicted by 2030, we'll have 1.5 million people um, on the social housing waiting list. Or the amount of hotels that we're going to have to use as temporary accommodation, or the fact that we're going to have more and more rough sleepers, those are going to be the real consequences as a result of that. I mean, last year, I think the, the government spent £17 billion on housing benefit. Imagine if we had enough homes, affordable homes for people to live in. Imagine where that £17 billion could have been invested in. And they think that this is a moral issue. If they don't want to deal with morals, we can talk about economics too and financial um, implications on them too. If they think 17 billion pounds is, not, is bad now, if we continue with the private rented sector, people are un, unable to afford private rents and, so for, and therefore having to be going to go put into social housing, but there's no social housing, so they're pushed back into the private rented sector and local councils are having to foot the bill for housing benefit. It's gonna be a lot worse in a few years to come. So not only is it beneficial to be dealing with this issue of housing, temporary accommodation, poor quality housing, climate change, and the effects on our housing short term? There are long-term implications too. But above all of that is the implications on people's lives. And that's the point I want to make. We deal with housing as units. We deal with house and people as commodities rather than seeing them as human beings. And we can talk about theory and economics and whatnot, but fundamentally that is what matters. If people are dying in their homes, especially six and a half years under, after Grenfell, there is a serious problem. And I, I, I'm starting to question now whether that problem is they don't understand the scale of this issue or they simply don't care about the scale of this issue. Why? Because it's not directly affecting them or people from their class, people from their background. They have no experience in that. And I mean, that comes down to representation in Westminster. I mean, we talk about it. We talk about diversity and rep uh, representation like a tick, the tick box exercise that it is, and I absolutely hate it. Because we go down the list of characteristics when it comes to diversity in Westminster, but nowhere do you see class. There is no class diversity in there. How can we truly be representative of a nation and a country if we are missing out a large proportion of British society and those are working class individuals with very different issues and struggles to everyone else in society? We can't be truly representative and we can't address the issues in the right way if we don't have everyone from different backgrounds sat at the table and given their input. And that's the problem. That's the problem with politicians at the moment and I think um, government and policies over the last few years. Not only have we been thinking short term, but we have not been including those that are going to be affected by those policies 
around the table too when we're having these conversations. These, some of these policies aren't hard to fix. Some of these policies aren't going to cost a lot of money. You get the right people around the table that have been affected and have lived experience. They will tell you how to fix it in the right way. But until they realize that, we're going to find ourselves continuing these conversations and a continuation of suffering and a continuation of struggle. I'll be here 30 years from now campaigning on the same issues I really hope I won't be. <laughs> um, but this is why these conversations are so important um, and why we need to, to keep having it. And it's so important to hear from, from different people like Abdi having different lived experience to, to, to really understand the breadth of problems we're seeing as a result of the same sort of issues. Um, I was up at, in Tower Hamlets not long ago with you and we were speaking to, to people that are having similar issues to what I campaign on and housing issues and struggles within council housing. But also we saw um, recently with the, the, the local rubbish, was it the rubbish strikes? The local rubbish strikes and the way people were angry and infuriated. So people have become tired, sick and tired is the only way you can, you, you can really, really describe it. And they, they, they need change, they want change, but the right change. They don't want to be promised the wrong things. So what I know I'm going to be doing is continuing to campaign on this issue come the next general election and beyond and trying to push this agenda within housing of the real issues that matter and have constantly been neglected by consecutive governments. And that is the way in which people's lives ultimately are at stake at the heart of this crisis that they really need to deal with. Not promising this false idea off of the back of a global, off of the back of a global pandemic and a cost of living crisis, that we will be the government to make sure you can own your own home. For a lot of people and young people, it's impossible. We now have people in their 40s having to live at, at home because of how unaffordable things have become. You cannot just dangle a golden carrot in front of us and expect us to believe it now. People, have, people, people see what is happening. So what I'm going to be doing is pushing this issue of social housing, the need for more quality social housing and rented accommodation, reform in the rented accommodation sector, but also addressing climate change and the impact on people's homes. We cannot just be building homes for the sake of it and just knocking up units and, 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 and shoving people in just to meet targets and say we're reducing homelessness. We have to build homes that can last, because if we don't, if we think we've got a housing crisis now, in 20 years' time, we're going to be talking about a housing crisis within homes that were built in the last 20 years and these new builds that are falling apart because they're so poor quality after a few years. I've seen it. After Grenfell, we need to be, we absolutely should expect more. It's, I think, if, if not just for the people of Grenfell, but the future generation and future children too, who are going to have to be subject to whatever decisions are being made now. So we have to be making sure the right decisions are, and that's why conversations like this is so important. I don't know how much time I've taken up, but I think, I, I didn't even set my timer. I will leave it there, though. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, yeah, yeah. Will we be in here? Yeah, uh, okay. so sense check. We were going to have a little conversation. It was going to be hosted by Amara, but unfortunately Amara hasn't been able to join us today. Would people like us to have an in convo here, or would people like us to go to a space outside? I'm going to put, put your hands up for in here, and put your hands up for outside. Okay, the in here's have have one. So um, that was it was a bit like Brexit. That was it was that was a, that was a 50, very close. Yeah, it was a fifty-one forty-nine type situation. Sorry, the in here's have have uh, one, um, but we can still take the walk to the pavilion towards the end if anybody wants to sit out in the site and just see a place where they can have a conversation. Um, so we will have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so please, uh, <coughs> yeah, maybe, maybe make it a little bit more friendly and come to the front. Thank you so much. Um, we will have some time for questions, so I would encourage you to, to be prepared with that. And I'm going to kick off with a few. Um, I want to say thank you uh, so much to Abdi and Quajo. And I guess, like, I started to frame this in the early, in the early um, part. <coughs> Sorry, in the early part of the talk where I guess one of the reasons why I, we'll talk a lot about why I'm so deeply grateful for your work and I'm sure for all of you, um, you will see for yourselves why the work that Abdi and Quajo and many of their peers are doing is so critical. Um, but there's kind of a different reason uh, that 
that I feel so grateful. Um, like I have kind of really embodied experience when I see them turn up to places and particularly uh, seeing you do what you've done over the last few years, Kwejo. Because I think that there's something really deeply problematic about people who have been so, uh, people who are the products of colonization who are in the UK because of um, the UK's behavior over the last 400 years, uh, particularly, then having to le relive their stories and their trauma so often. Um, I'm always really careful with our team when we're inviting Kwejo particularly, because I'm like, there's certain places where I feel so sick to my stomach that this is what has to happen. And so like, in, in order to replay that, that trauma and replay that story um, in some places where it can be seen as entertainment, like, come on, come on, you go speak truth to power. You, like, you've rolled in, I'm sure, you know, you know when it happens, right? Where you're like, go on, like, give, give them what is. Um, and, and how troublesome that is. Um, and so I want to invite everyone to really um, think about the questions they have. But I also really want you to think about some of the questions I'm going to ask as well. Is, is like, what you're going to do with what you've heard? Like, I think it's really important the load and labor on the work that you both do um, is really significant mm -hmm. and really unjust and really not fair um, and really critical and we're really grateful as well. Um, so I just really, I really invite everyone to like tap into what on earth you are gonna do with what you've heard um, today because that really matters. Um, it really, really matters so deeply because I, I want our people to live and have joy mm -hmm. and be able to propose the future. And I want them not to be broken and destroyed by fighting, I would argue, a system that doesn't care, that sees um, the people that, that um, you often have been right at the heart of supporting as disposable, as kind of like you know, a part of society that, well, you know, and I'll go as far as saying that just don't matter in the eyes of power in this country. And I think we've seen that over and over again. So for me, um, it's really important that you treat this time and this labor and this conversation with respect um, and respect for all that goes into needing to share that. And I've heard you share it multiple times, right? So I can't imagine how often, how often you have. So I just want to say thank you. Um, because I, cause I, cause you're beautiful souls as well, and I want you to also tell stories of the hope and the joy and the future, but also we know how critical it is for you to keep talking about um, and keep campaigning for and keep sharing some of the worst of that. But there is no doubt, don't ever think how well people present themselves, they never think that this doesn't have a deep, deep toll. Um, and I, you know, the book, Our Body Keeps School, um, so I want, you to, I want you to really like think about your active solidarities. I really want you to think about what that looks like out of this session. And I want you to think about what you're going to do with recordings. I want you to think about what you've done with hearing it. I don't want you to go, oh, you know, Kwejo, let's try and get him to our next event now because that was really great. I, want, I really need us to like be active in our solidarities. Um, so yeah, that's my invitation. And again, thank you to both. So yeah, let's let's we'll move from like the difficult stuff to to the more hopeful stuff, which I think you both span really really well. And we'll have some space for questions. Um, we'll take them in one round, and then we'll have a convo. So, so yeah, I just shared very much about how much um, replaying and living within so many different traumas has played a part in in um, your work and how you are so exposed to. Um, to that in, a, in the everyday, in the work that you do. Um, Abdi, I want to start with you, and I just would love, you, you talked a lot about healing, spirituality, therapy, um, re returning to the relationship of land. Can you tell us a bit more about how, about that space that bridges people's lived experiences that are um, really, really challenging and troubling and difficult, and how you've been working to build this kind of journey of of healing, of care, what that looks like, and how you move people into the space of hope and possibility, and how you hold those two worlds together. 
<laughs> um, thank you for that, Amy. That was really beautiful because you are right. So much of the challenges, we are sharing our story, right? And then you go home and you feel somatically, and I love the body keeps the score too when I read it many years ago. This idea that we just share is extractive and then we don't like just sit on the sofa and we carry that every day. And thank you for that, sharing your, your story in that way as well, Kishore. That really touched me deeply because my father too also died of cancer, pancreatic cancer. And when he was dying, the ceiling collapsed on us too. It's a very common story. Um, and this particular landlord, whose name I will mention in this moment, um, has a really bad reputation nationally. But I have always believed in how I manage rage as a person. So I, I pray five times a day. That helps me. I also am in nature a lot. But it is really important for me to come from a place of empowerment. And, and Bell Hook speaks on love. And um, I believe everything is love. In, in the same way that our, that sign that says our economics is a living system, I believe our life is a living system of love. And so every day we're dealing with crisis. We have a, a, a huge housing campaign at the moment with 115 women as part of a systemic litigation case. And all really terrible housing um, in Tower Hamlet specifically, uh, where we're hopefully going to the high court soon for an amazing um, legal firm called One Pump Court uh, to start a judicial review. But one of the key things for us was to identify the crisis, identify some of the gaps around the healing that's needed. So we decided to build uh, a, a group of the women, a space where we can eat together, where we can pray together, where we can congregate, where we can plant and um, particularly use the tomatoes and other food in the community garden to cook. From a um, problematic drug use perspective, as somebody who's been um, uh, sober for many years now, it's really important for me to work with people in crisis in a reimagined way. So we've opened a crisis cafe for people who are actively using, and th the first thing we do is feed them. And we, we um, also provide healing, mental health, recovery, and support. I think we're, we, we have to really try our best, not just to re-traumatize ourselves, because it's so important for me to um, focus on that internal healing too, but to just focus on love and joy. And so everything we touch, to me, as a, as a practice, has to be rooted in love and joy. And that means how we design our projects, how we co-produce, how we deliver, the language we use, how I lead if, in my embodied leadership. And, and I think life is so short. This dunya in Arabic, there is this phrase, which is life, is two seconds. We believe it's like a blink, literally. So it's so important that we have uh, pockets of dunya and everyday joy. And that can be anything. In my culture, we're talkers. I love to talk. I'm a we're storytellers. So we have chai and chata, or, or talking and, and, and chata. We have um, dance. We're, we're amazing somatic dance. We dance a lot. So I think it's just really important to express joy in this moment of, of real systemic crisis. And I think it has to be led in um, by, by me, firstly, as a leader, but also it has to be led within the team, but also in community. So um, we don't focus on the scarcity, although there's so much. It's really important for us to focus on the love and joy on a daily basis and to embody that and to use that and open the knowledge and have it open source as well. Thanks so much, Abdi. Um, so, Kwejo, you, you spend your time, I mean, sometimes I've seen you do talks where you show a few of your uh, videos, um, which I'd really thoroughly recommend following Kwejo on social media, uh, because you'll get to see um, some, of, some of the way his campaigning uh, has played out and has been so, so powerful. But you spend a lot of your time in, like, seeing, like, immediate, everyday crisis and the impacts of that. Um, how how do you hold being in in that all the time, and uh, you know the ability to hope and dream and uh, build towards brighter futures? And what what do you see um, in your work in the communities that you meet that is helping helping people to come together around that? And it's okay if you say I really don't, and like <laughs> we we need to do more. But I'm just interested in how you navigate this because you also. I, Ever since I've met you, you come across um, a such light all the time. You're just like light, and I just like how how do you do it? So what's what's going on for you? How do you relate to the, this this sort of early part of this conversation? Yeah, no, thank you. Um, it's interesting because to say that it's not difficult, I'd be lying. Um, there are times that I've walked into people's homes 
feeling absolutely fine and then left and the rest of the day I'm like massively depressed. I mean, it's just, especially when I'm going into homes where there are people going through what it was that only a few years ago I was going through with my dad. There was one lady, for example, who was, um, I'm not sure if she's still with us um, actually, but she, was, she had stage four um, lung cancer and she was living in a home filled with damper mold that she'd been complaining about and they, they did nothing basically. There was another lady with stage four um, breast cancer and she reached out to me because she wanted her home sorted. But I think the saddest part was not for herself but out of concern for her young son and knowing that one day she, soon she will no longer be with him, but to make sure that he had somewhere that he could call home and she knew that he was safe and he wasn't having to go through all the stresses and having to try and deal with that as a young kid. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to make sure that was the last thing she'd done for him. And that for me, I was very upset after that, I think. Um, going to people's homes where there was a disabled lady who was um, having to sleep on her sofa and she lost people in Grenfell. And her, her bedroom ceiling had collapsed, she had constant leaks, she was suffering with severe PTSD from Grenfell and um, she wasn't getting the help and it was her, her niece that reached out to me on social media and said, I'm really, I'm really worried about this person and that they're going to take their own life. And I received messages like that and I, I went and we're still very much friends now and a situation has been sorted. Um, it took a while and it took ITV getting involved, um, ITV News, but there's loads of situations like that that are very traumatic and very similar to my own story. Um, and that's, that, that's the sad part about it, is it's, it's not just me and my story, it's, it's hundreds of thousands of people up and down the country going through similar. Um, but for me, I, I know that in terms of my mental health, and that's the question I often get asked is, how do you look after your mental health and whatnot? Um, I don't have the answer to that, to be fair. Um, I know what I felt and how I felt after my dad passed away and going through all of that. and. I mean, the fact that I considered no longer being here, mm -hmm. I, mean, it, I think speaks very loudly of how bad things were. And I'm convinced now that no matter what happens, mentally I can cope because I know what it's like to feel like at my very worst and some days are hard. But the, the, the joy that I do get is going into people's homes and it's happened many times where I go in with a camera and a film, put on social media, they could have been complaining for 10 years, 15 years, ignored, they moved out within 24 hours and moved somewhere else, or a young child, seeing a young child being taken out, moved and moved into a new home, and, and they're so grateful, and it's not, I, I don't ever want thanks for it. Mm -hmm. I, I somehow, I do it as a way of sort of repaying my guilt for not being able to take my dad out of the situation he was in, and I'm very open about that, I think, and honest about that, and I do blame myself in that sense, but the satisfaction I get from that, no money, no amount of money or anything else can bring that, and that's why it's worth it for me. Um, so in terms of my mental health, that's what looks after it, I think. Um, although it is hard and it's constant, and even this morning I've received loads of messages and emails, and I am one person, I can't deal with absolutely everyone and everything, and, and I have to try my best to try and have a, some sort of a life too. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when you're receiving messages at 12 o'clock um, at night or one o'clock in the morning, or you're, you're having to stop everything that you had planned for your day because someone's had a massive leak and they need your help, or people are really just being taken advantage of. It is, um, it is hard, and when you get loads of those come through, sometimes it's over my own. I remember one day, 30 families reached out to me on a single day, and I thought, it's, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. um, but I know there is a, the end of the light, and there is the opportunity for change, and I haven't come this far just to come this far sort of thing. I mean, I've, I've got to this point for a reason. I've got the ear of politicians for a reason. I have these meetings for a reason. I, I'm able to, to, to shame landlords online and get the results I do for a reason. So I can't just stop now knowing that there's so many others up and down the country going through, uh, going through similar. But one day, I will, I will be happy to, if I'm able to say, I no longer have to do it because it's done. Mm -hmm. it's, it's fixed, it's sorted, but who knows? <laughs> Thank you so much. That you, I'm going to stay with you for a second. You talk about that that light, like you can see you haven't come this far, and you talked a bit about um, organising around the general election, mm -hmm. and you talked about the numbers of people that are reaching out to you. Um, tell us a bit more about that light. Like, what are you, what are you, what gives you hope on the on the wider picture, and what what do you need others 
to be doing around you, like um, from that wider uh, systemic like campaigning and uh, influencing space? What do you need people in this room um, and other rooms uh, to be doing alongside you? Um, I think what's given me hope is those situations that I spoke about earlier, people actually being moved out. So there is the opportunity there for situations where people are really struggling for change to come about. And I mean, Grenfell United have been campaigning for so long. And what gives me hope is there is room for change there. I just need to convince people to actually care about the right issues when it comes to housing. I've managed to grab the ear of senior politicians in government. So if I can influence their proposals come the next general election, then I'm going to do everything to do that. And if I can't do that, I'll make it very clear to the general public that what they're promising is they're selling you up the river, basically. Mm -hmm. There is a massive crisis here where people are struggling, and ultimately, they have a responsibility to answer to us as the people that vote for them, because it's all good and well them coming out every five years to beg for our votes. But if you're not dealing with the things that are affecting and impacting the lives of the majority and it's costing people's lives, you are failing at your job. And quite frankly, I don't think, if that's the case and you're happy with allowing that to happen, you should ever be anywhere near a place of power, especially dictating over um, everyone's lives across, across the UK. You absolutely shouldn't be. Um, so I think that's what gives me hope, is I know politicians want to be in number 10. Mm -hmm. But I also know that to get there, they are going to have to convince us as a people that they're willing to fix the right issues. And if they're not willing to fix the right issues when it comes to housing, and they want to sell everyone up the river with the whole idea of home ownership, when we've got a rental sector on its absolute knees, and people's lives being taken in social housing because of the conditions they're living in, then I'm going to do everything in my power to make it clear that, and, and make sure everyone understands that they're, they're not doing what's right by us as the people. They're not dealing with the existential issues that have existed for generations. They are trying to basically um, cover a carrot in, 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 in glitter and dangle it in front of our faces and expect us to, to bite. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what gives me hope. Thank you. Uh, um, I, I really appreciate you sharing that because there's, I think like if there's one person that uses shame yeah, that's another thing, actually. Like, listen, <laughs> you know, I've read enough Brene Brown to know, you know, shame ain't great. But if there's one person that uses shame well, it is Quajo. I really, like, you have been, like, generation-defining in the way that you've, you've like, used technology, um, uh, a different generation's uh, ability to communicate with the world, um, and then the way you've, like, mobilised shame. Um, but also uh, then use the platform that you have to start building literacy. Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of come back to Abdi on this before I'm going to open up for like maybe three, four questions in one, one block. Um, so this piece about literacy, right? Like I think that one of the things that Quajo does so, so well, I'm sure you've, you've seen it as well, is the utilization of shame, right? And like, listen, I'm all here for it. I really, really am. <laughs> I'm like, well, you know, because I'm always there, yeah, like, go yeah. off. Um, but, uh, the way in which you've used it and the, the responsibility with which you use it towards, towards like, uh, concentrated power, right? Like, you're not just using it on every next man walking down the road. You're, like, really using it on people that have concentrated wealth and power. And um, I think that's just so, so important. And, like, I, you know, I remember most of my childhood, my uh, dad was, like, constantly fighting uh, the council mm. because my grandmother on my dad's side um, was severely mentally ill and lived in council housing and like the shame like I didn't understand it then but the shame that I like the two sides of my family like have and when I look back now we just don't even have any photos because of the way in which like the, sh the shame of living conditions and mental health and those struggles and um, how much the shame is concentrated on those experiencing the worst of life instead of those who were concentrating the wealth and the power to mean that they had terrible lives. I just love the shift, the shift of like, um, and I feel like the people, the, on the whole, I can see this like window of people moving more towards being able to look at how to utilize our power in the strongest ways. So I just feel like that's really, really important. And, but with it, what you do is you communicate in a way that just, you know, my mum could understand, like, what's actually going on. Mm. And this is linked to something I wanted to talk to you about, Abdi, was that um, I think there's a real movement uh, across uh, 
many of uh, our organizations, the people we work alongside, I know we have many connected peers, of like the work to um, translate and make literate so much. One example is the Worker Centric Lab. I know that, that uh, kind of joins us up a little bit. Um, and the really important work they've done of um, bringing to the surface um, what's happening, giving access to many people like us, uh, knowledge, tools, data, research, that in turn we can um, translate into experiences that give our communities agency and literacy to start to learn. And one thing that came up for me when Quajo was talking about, um, I, I just don't actually think they care, right? So not even if they understand, I don't think they care. I was thinking recently about the piece of work that Centric have done around um, sacrifice zones like these places that we know are all over London as well, where uh, mega polluters are allowed to just pollute because we as a country believe those communities and those people are, um, like we can sacrifice them, right? They don't matter that much. They're not, I don't know what other people would say. They, uh, they don't look the right way. They don't do the right things. They don't, they're not economically productive enough. All the, the racism and everything that comes with it. And... I feel like really hopeful about this, the beginnings of how our communities, one, are coming together, and two, are starting to share um, knowledge, data, research, work, and then in turn, starting to build spaces where our communities really feel like they can talk about economics or they can talk about air quality or housing, and it feels really powerful. Um, it isn't just this kind of like, let's write to those in power or let's just fight against them. There's something starting to happen where some of that power agency, like the shift is happening. Um, and I'm just, and I, I feel that about your work as well, Quadra, because I feel like the tide is going to turn, yo. Uh, mm. It's going to be pretty, hope so. hopefully it's not like French Revolution style, but I feel, <laughs> I feel like we're on, a, we're on a moment where that, that, those power um, is, is changing. So I'm just, I, and I feel like it's a long journey, so I don't mean it like next month, but... Tell me a bit more about this. Like you, you have been starting to use a lot of that work, um, and a lot of the young black men that you work with, um, a lot of the communities you work with, are starting to like imagine other economic possibilities, other futures. Like, tell me about this piece. You've been in it for twenty years. What are you feeling about this time? What do you feel about the work that's happening and the potential that's starting to bubble amongst um, so many of us? Um, so firstly, I agree. I think, I've, yes, Gracia, you started this whole generation of, of flogging and dragging <laughs> yeah, and yeah, leaders man. on social media. <laughs> <laughs> but done in a way that you mentioned Brene Brown earlier yes. and with this idea of having a, a strong back but a warm front, you know? Yeah, yeah. You do it in a way that is rooted in love. That's how I see it. Yes, it's strong, right? But it's the shame, and that's what I, 100% these leaders, political leaders with ego, uh, to have their names associated to damage in that way um, is powerful. And to me, I think you're right, you know, I think there is some kind of like hood revolution or revolution that's happening. Like I advocate it a lot, as I said earlier, around this idea of, of whether it's black futurism or hood futurism, just how do we see ourselves as, as marginalized communities in the hood in the next seven years, um, seven generations, 20 generations, when, when I'm long gone. And one of the things that I'm really fascinated by is, and have been for many years, is what you're doing and your team and the team are doing at Civic Square, right? And um, why I mentioned Kate earlier as well around donut economics. It's just these ideas that are so deeply rooted in transformation that, that takes time, that is messy, that holds a lot of tensions. But how do you transfer that? And I feel this urgency. How do you transfer all of this knowledge, traditional knowledge too, in a way that's practical? Mm -hmm. And one of the, the ideas that we've developed with the young black men is is this building that is rooted in hood futurism. And what, um, what they did yesterday, just literally yesterday, as I was watching the video, is they, they went to chapter three, Donut Economics, and they read the book first, eight of the boys at the, at the office, and they said, um, it, this is not landing. We don't quite understand all of what it means for us. So then the team that we work with, the uh, amazing team, said, why don't you read it, but then transfer some of that knowledge in rap? Mm. So they started rapping, right? And, and using economic terminology in a way that is rooted in, I don't know, like Nipsey Hussle did in, in Los Angeles, in the way that he built the hood. And, and I watched the video of the last rap, and yesterday I actually cried. Because I, I know 
this young man, Ibrahim, and how he started versus where he is today, and the participatory money we've now gifted him, a thousand pounds, to launch his particular, uh, at a pilot level, and all the other boys too. And then I look at what we're doing with Centric Labs, with the aunties at the Women's Cup in Hackney, and how to use indigenous healing practice, but using land. And uh, I saw Araceli, who's just beautiful, like we know, and speaking about holding your breath and breathing, and I just watched the room and there was 25 aunties all, all across the table. Sir Norman Lamb was there from SLAM, chairman. Just a group of people that, because we love inviting different people to share our knowledge and ideas. And I watched as the session ended an hour later and how the aunties were breathing, but when they were praying mm. and the difference. And the difference when they were walking out the building. And then later in the night through our women's cop lead, Warda, she said, Abdi, you won't believe. I was spending two hours with one of the aunties. And she was talking about how she, she felt something she had never felt before in her gut. And I think for me, it's these ideas about how you transfer all these incredible like ideas, but in a practical way. And, and just finally, for a campaigning perspective, when I met the current housing collective, we're, we're supporting 25 of the key women. And, and their stories, which was so traumatizing, right? And still are a year ago. And to see those same women now engaging with organizations in Bristol about how to community organize, how to use your rage and anger, how to storm buildings and do direct action, how to carry out systemic litigation. So I think what's beautiful is, is, is really goes back to being really mindful of citation is what Amara is doing, mm. my group, what you guys are doing at Civic Square, what's happening with Fazan Healing Justice, what you're doing, Quasia. All of these ideas are so critical, and, and I really do believe it, without sounding um, just too far gone, that it's possible, and I also believe there is a revolution, mm. because we are, you, you said earlier, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Mm. So I think we're at this point where new ideas must be born, mm. and, and that rage, um, strong back, warm front is very important at the moment. Thank you so much, Abdi. And um, for those of you on the live stream, but in the room as well, I, Amara was supposed to be having this conversation with you, so a lot of love to Amara if she's watching, but also to the work that uh, the Maya group and Abuelos is, is doing, and so much of the work that Amara um, has been at the forefront of is really, un like, you know, we're talking about really unpacking um, some of these ideas, especially around land and spatial justice, into um, everyday experiences, into rap, into I know um, she speaks so deeply and fondly of the work of Nipsey Hussle and so many, so many others. So please look up um, their work and to Araceli Camargo and Josh Artis from Centric Lab. They've actually got talks from this season's Retrofit Reimagined and last year's, um, especially Araceli's uh, talk on the home as the 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 start of healing uh, from last year, really powerful, and uh, Healing Justice London as well. For any of you who are in London, uh, they are doing uh, their rehearsing freedom season that they've just been doing a lot of really hard work to reorientate and create spaces of safety and healing for um, particularly Arab Muslims and Mus uh, Palestinian peoples. Um, and so, like, there's some really deep and rich intersectional on the ground and theoretically and uh, rooted as well as uh, f future focused work that I would just really recommend and yeah like you I'm, I'm literally always over the moon that we are coming together uh, in ways that feels just so powerful and across so many like disciplines um, but we're really holding strong in being like no we're going to find the spaces between I'm really grateful I think Sarah was talking about it earlier I'm really grateful for um people like Sarah Edmonds, John, Kate, others, like the way that we are trying to like work across us all um, with deep respect and solidarity and trying to bring the best of our skills and our knowledges to that. I feel incredibly hopeful. Um, so thank you both for, for this little bit. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna open up to if there are a couple of questions, I'll take them all in one go and then we'll answer them in one go and wrap up as well. We'll go here and then to John and to Ricky. Cool, and then that, that will be it for this session, if that's okay. Thank you. Um, Taz? You mentioned a question about um, the same of cancelizing uh, what really impressed me was that uh, people uh, who were really cancelizing had the right to buy, but other social houses like housing associations, they don't have the right to buy. So there's a disparity in terms of that. And then um, I used to work with the law firm, and I used to notice that some people 
But yeah, they got these two things and they got into some clothing, pretending that they were separated from their partners so that they could then buy them. Um, well, I find it annoying, but I, I agree that they should be um, the possibility to buy the home that you live in, but I don't agree that it should be discounted at all. Mm -hmm. uh, there should be the possibility for people to get onto the ladder by way of, like, say, um, shared ownership so that people who are in a, you know, not such a good situation can, can do that. But the idea of taxpayers' money and um, not being, in, being invested in more social housing because we're losing all that money by giving such big discounts. Um, and then it sort of creates a culture of people thinking, oh, you know, we want social, you know, we want council housing. And they're not sort of planning about um, leaving social housing that they can do uh, because they can afford to buy a house. Um, so I think that, that needs to be re-examined uh, fully. Yeah, thank you so much, Charles. We'll talk about that a little bit. You spoke about the distribution and the, the fairness of what's happening as well. So we can pick up some of those knots and tensions uh, in a moment as well. John? Huge thanks, firstly, um, to Andy and Crecho. I think, you know, this has just been such a great session because it's brought together the absolute worst that is happening in this country and in this planet at the moment with some of the absolute best. You know, this has been one of the most heartwarming sessions that I've been in, amazingly. You know, although you, you've just really confronted um, the awfulness. Um, and I want to give, I don't know if he's watching a live stream, but I just want to give credit to Cameron Shazan in, in Birmingham, who would have loved to have been here, but with everything that's happening, he does need to be with his community in, in Birmingham uh, this, this weekend. Uh, and when he introduced us, she very kindly referenced, you know, the work that Cameron and uh, Sheikh Nuru and others in, in the, in the Bolsonaro faith communities have been so much at the forefront of leading what we have, we commonly have managed to achieve in, in Bolsonaro. And uh, I, I loved um, this is really a question for Andy as much as anything, because I just love what you were saying about you, you were referencing, you know, you were, you were um, praying together, the faith community, all those sorts of things, and you were, you were referencing deep healing and liberation um, and um, love and joy. And you know, for me, I think hope is a slightly questionable word now, but love and joy are really positive words, and it seems. From the session we had with, with the Donut Economics unrolling it yesterday, mm -hmm. um, Kate's work sort of morphed with Civic Square to introduce some of these concepts um, in, in, into, into the Donut. Um, and you know, this session for me has really grown with that, and that's where we've been in Bolsa Heath. So, you know, we, we had in mostly road bars, we, we particularly wanted to bring um, a place for prayer and, and those, those sort of things, you know, for people to give messages of, of love and, and joy. And um, so my question really is, for some people, you know, as soon as you talk about faith tradition, they turn on and that sort of thing. But, you know, that is, whether we call this liberation, hope, love, joy, faith tradition, whatever, how do we, how do we make that um, apparent and reach out across the divides? Because, you know, faith tradition is not, this is my faith tradition, it must be done this way and you don't agree. So it's how do we sort of spread that, that love and joy across uh, I'd love to know your, your tips as to how we can all from our different perspectives do that. Thank you so much, John. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Fazana and I had a conversation publicly, I think, about this recently as well. So um, we can talk, because, yeah, I agree with you. It can be a massive turn off the second, uh, especially in, like, in the UK. You bring up anything that isn't um, completely neat and in a certain box. Um, so I'll be really interested to know how you... Uh, uh, deal with that as well. And um, Ricky, would you like to ask your last question? Yeah, I'd like to say, um, you two are both very inspirational. Um, and, you know, wow, and yeah, and hats off to you, to you guys. Because it's just a struggle. It's just a struggle that we do. I'm the same with Hamza, like um, the area you're from, Hamza is possibly the best, worst area in the UK. But the fact is, there's nice people, nice all your locations, there's a good thing going on. But, like, like Tower Hamlets, um, I don't know. And, and, like, you know, it's just um, drugs, gangs, and violence. But the, the issue is my, the thing what I do, yeah, so um, I live like a hunter in Andrews Road, yeah, and I actually pick up the guitar on my side of the road, I actually pick people's rubbish up and put it back in the front of the door, I walk and knock on their doors, excuse me, this is, this is
This is council property, you know, like I promised you, when I first came to Bamsley like seven years ago, there were, you could even walk past the pavement, it's gone on the road. We had old ladies on our road, and they, they, they had to walk on the road just to get around the pavement. It's mad, it's almost like, it's, uh, hands up, it's like 80, like 1980s. No cameras, no police, the council don't care, they're rubbish, that was mad. You know, prostitution, drugs, crime, break-ins, all sorts. You can't leave nothing in your garden to get taken, it's that bad. But the thing is, I've been doing it since COVID, so I've been doing it about uh, picking up rubbish and keeping my side of the street clean. I try to get neighbours involved, they won't get involved. They've got Mercedes, BMs, free houses, golden gates. I'm saying to you, don't you feel embarrassed about the rubbish in the road? Mm. Yeah, don't want it. Like, my mum came from London and she's like, what? I can't believe it. It's just, just tips and tips and they're rubbish everywhere. I'm just like, Mom, there's no community spirit. They don't care. They look so behind. You know, they got golden gates. You know, golden frames. But still, you know, they don't care about the rubbish in the room. So we got out of the association. So we, there's a lady there, um, and she, she started the association a long time ago. But they never picked the road, so I got them sometimes. But now she's involved in the council. She's got the contacts for the local MP. The local MP came, and the council and uh, Naomi came, and I came. Walk down the road, I pointed out, I don't care what people think of me, you know, I'm not afraid of nothing. But, um, you know, I pointed out people's houses regularly. We walked into people's houses there, we knocked on their doors, we walked through the alleyways, and we said, you've got to clean it up. I've already been to them and said, look, man, you've got to clean it up, nothing happened. So when the council came, and um, when Naomi came, we went to these houses, we went through the alleys as well. But we also went into the shops, there's a the shops there, yeah, and they don't publish there constantly on our own. I know it's him, I've seen him do it. He hasn't got no bins. So, you, you, and so he's been doing it for years. It's almost like in the community, um, the, the people living have given up. And you find that a lot, man. And it's like, you have done things like, you know, um, like what you do, I play football as well. So, you know, we've got such diverse people there, like, you know, black, Somalia, African, some refugees, some people got no hope. And then obviously, you can see them, they come, they love football, but they're skinny, it's probably haven't eaten. And I've had all their nourishments and drinks, and I've had lots of water, and I feel bad when I drink that, and I always offer, you know, the fact is, people, the fact is, everyone wants to say space, everyone wants to get together, we're just people, we're just, we're just a community living in the same area. I'm like, well, where you're from, this is like, you know, get together. So I've been playing football um, for like six years now, so I'm not the eldest there, so they, I, I've been saying things to these guys, like, you're all one, no racism, no this, no that, no this, no that. And it's working, man. Yeah. It, it didn't work straight away, but it worked. There's a guy, my number two in the pot, a smiling guy, a um, Shimake, really good guy, man. I, I speak to him all the time, man. He kind of looks up to me, I look up to him, even though he's younger, like 20 years younger. But he, he's, he's really popular. So I go through Smoke now, and then Smoke realise, you know, what I'm saying is right. But you should see the change. You know, when the ball gets kicked in your face, they'll carry on. Now they'll stop, they have compassion, they care. But you know, they can't run, like, and, but it, it's just a struggle, man. Like, you know, the, the police, the cameras, so everyone knows about the rubbish. But, it, you know, if it was in a rich area, if it, if it was in the city centre, where tourists are, like, they don't care. But like, they want them dumping, it feels like they want their dumping area. In, in Birmingham and hands up, it's okay. The people just don't care. Like, you know, there's, there's no people, there's no fight, yeah. there's no community spirit. It, it annoys me because like, I police the streets, I even speak to the policemen. So the police are coming next week and I say, Can I walk down with you on Rockley Road and I'll talk that with the people? He said, No, because you get yourself in danger. I don't care. I was like, These people have to find out that what they're doing is wrong. Thank you, Ricky. I'm yeah. just gonna, I'm just gonna ask All these right. guys. No, no. Thank yeah. you so much. And you, you folks should like. We should definitely like carry on the conversation. I just want to get these last little reflections so that you also don't miss the last of the lunch spots as well. Um, but yeah, there's, uh, there's a couple of uh, different reflections, um, and I'd just be interested for you to say some closing reflections on like building hope where there's no hope, um, and the role of uh, faith and how you navigate that in, in uh, British society would be really uh, amazing. And then we'll wrap up. Thank you. Yeah, um, I just really, really, quick, before I forget, um, touch upon the point of um, council housing, but also, I can't remember the term, it's not home ownership, it's, it's when, when you part own part 
a shared ownership. Yeah. Um, the th yeah, the threshold for, 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 for many individuals, I mean, the deposits and whatnot that you have to put down is completely unaffordable. Um, I think that's the problem with shared ownership, along, along with a, a, a lot of other issues. Um, in regards to social housing and council housing, I, I completely agree that they should, they should, get, they should get rid of um, the, the, the right to buy scheme. That's not me saying that like working class individuals and families shouldn't own their own home, absolutely. But there are alternatives to the right to buy scheme. I think we should look at public housing and social housing like we do with the NHS and the hospital beds. If we wouldn't sell off the NHS and we wouldn't sell off hospital beds, we shouldn't be selling off public housing too. And if you get to a position where you're in social housing, right, and you can afford to put a deposit down on a property, then perhaps you don't need social housing probably as desperately as the 1.4 million people waiting to get in there. I definitely think we should get rid of or suspend the right to buy scheme and offer an alternative for working class people to get into, and this is something that I'm going to put forward, is get rid of the right to buy scheme. And while you do that, you're still offering social housing tenants discounted rent. Give them an incentive to save up a certain amount towards a deposit. Then as local authorities or housing associations or government even provide funding to match that to then allow them to purchase or put a deposit down on one of the genuinely affordable homes that they say they're going to buy. That way, you're not selling off the social housing that we so desperately need and need to contribute towards because of the 1.4 million people wanting to get into social housing, 131,000 homeless kids. You're still allowing them to purchase a property, but not at the expense of social housing and other working class individuals too. Now, again, I'm someone off of an estate. Um, I'm a 25 year old off of an estate in Mitcham, and I'm able to think of situations like that we've seen the right to buy scheme hasn't worked for 40 years. Why are our politicians that we're paying 80k plus in taxpayers' money, why can't they think of solutions to these problems when it is so easy to sit around a table and actually think? Um, and that's the questions that we need to, to be asked. And I definitely think that we should allow working class people and it should encourage people if they want to, working class individuals, to buy their own homes and give them that opportunity. They shouldn't be excluded from that. Um, but I think not at the expense of social housing and other people so desperately reliant on public sector housing. And in terms of, I know you mentioned the right to buy scheme for housing associations. So currently, I think there's a pilot on for um, the right to acquire within housing association properties. But I look at that the same way I look at the right to buy. You're still selling off social housing. Um, and that's something that needs to change. And I think in terms of culture and attitude, that, that is a big problem, especially like you say, in communities where um, you, it was predominantly social housing, but it's changed over the last few years and decades. And estates have, and social housing has had such a bad stigma. And, 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 and people, when they go in search of social housing now, they look for deprived areas. They look for poverty when trying to locate estates and social housing. And that in itself says all it needs to about the way in which we view social housing in these sorts of areas um, as, as, as a nation. And that ultimately needs to change. We shouldn't really be able to tell the difference between social housing and a privately rented property or a home owned property. Why is there any difference? Why must social housing be related to poverty and deprivation? It shouldn't. Um, because that's what it incentivizes issues like crime and gang culture and poverty and littering, like you said. But also, what I think you're doing is great. You should be calling out individuals that don't feel like there's a need just because they're from a, a, a more privileged background, perhaps, or they own their own home, or they've got gold gates and a Mercedes. We need more community. And everyone needs to take responsibility, but there, are, there is this attitude, not just from like your neighbours, but I think in general, even politicians, where they look down at it and think, that's beneath them. What do you mean pick up litter on the street? That's beneath me. And that's the culture that needs to change, because if we were a nation that thought about others as equally as we think about ourselves, we wouldn't have half the problems we, fight, we face now as a country. Mm -hmm. And I think ultimately that needs to change, and it's small steps like that. Thank you so much, and, and, and I really appreciate it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, because people are going to miss lunch otherwise, I'm afraid, so I'm not going to have any come, come back. So I'm going to give Abdi the last word. I'll come over. And then you can all chat over lunch and carry on, OK? Um, sorry to be that, that guy, but I just want to make sure you have lunch. Abdi, you've got the last word. I know we're all hungry, so I'm going to be very quick for John. But I think you asked a really important question, because to me, I spoke about hope earlier. And to, to have citation practice, Mariama Kaba speaks about hope as a discipline. And to me, um, whether it's Bell Hooks or Mariama Kaba, Kaba or other, other people who have who led the way, uh, Audrey Lord speaks on, that we don't live single issue lives, right? And I think the, 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 the kind of practical way we've done it, we, we partner with other faith groups. So we work currently in Hamlets with a, an amazing Sikh temple who do lots of voluntary work. We feed community, we go out into outreach into estates, etc. We also work across 
churches, and particularly Church of England, um, an amazing um, brother who's a canon and, 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 a, and, and the only, to the best of my knowledge, black queer um, canon and soon priest. And we look at land justice work together. We also work with other groups, the Buddhist temple in Bethel Green, and we do um, co-sharing co and co-learning of our different knowledges and how we can go out and heal into community. And I think just to, to finalize, um, in, in, the, in the sector we're all in, we know that funders say specifically, you shouldn't uh, mention faith or speak on religion. And, and I actually divest from that. We're very clear when we write our, and I spend a lot of time writing applications at the moment, but when we're writing bids and applications that actually uh, there is liberation in faith. And that is, um, in my faith certainly, this practice which we use amongst the team, which is um, a, a, an Islamic phrase called, verily with hardship comes ease. And right now especially, that's a constant reminder for us that because things are so tough, that, that ease is coming. Uh, and hardship is here today, but each e ease is coming. So it's so important for us to focus on that, to focus on the positives, to focus on the light, to focus on the joy, to focus on the love, to focus on the connectedness of our injustice and the, and the fight that we have, and to support each other and, and the amazing work that we've heard for Quasia, for Imi and, 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 and Bing, who I met at a collective uh, a couple of years ago, to keep focusing on those moments that we are connected. And that's my advice, to just knock on those doors at those faith spaces and say, come inside and let's share and let's love and let's build and let's strategize. Because I think that's so important right now. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I fully um, agree with the divesting from the ability to bring um, many different stories to the table because if we had hours, we can talk about the <laughs> colonial roots of basically losing everything that actually connected us across many different solidarities, faiths, practices. And Fazana Khan of Healing Justice London really beautifully said a few weeks ago that whatever it is for you, connect to... Oops. Connect to source, whatever that is, if that's faith, if that's a god, if that's the land, if that's water, reconnect, divest your attentions from the things that are extractive and are driving uh, us into many, many dark holes and reconnect to soul, uh, source. That might be each other, it might be your families, it might be the land, the soil, the air, the water, it might be God, it might be faith, faith community. Um, and, and think about that practice as a rigorous practice that brings us all back into the fight for justice and liberation. And if you can't do that, be in solidarity, amplify, share these guys' work, support them, support those who are struggling the most, support the fights for liberation against occupied lands, support the communities near you, um, just don't be passive. It's not a time to be passive. I want to say thank you so much for coming to this session. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, please move swiftly straight to the lunch line. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so
Okay, sorry, I was got faffed around, wondered if we could immediately retrofit some technology that we already owned so that you could have a look into the moss world. Um, my name is Alice Fowler, and I am a gardener by training. Um, that happened a very long time ago at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew and at the New York Botanic Gardens and at Wisley. Um, and then, since being a gardener, I've been many different things, always about plants, but I'm prepared to explore the world of plants in every which way. And most of my life I've been, subsequently I've been a journalist, so I write for The Guardian, and um, I used to have a column, the Saturday column in the magazine. So if you look a tiny bit familiar, it's because you've flipped past my face while having coffee on a Saturday morning. Now, um, I have spent the last year immersing myself in the land of bogs. So I decided I would write a book all about bogs because I really, really love bogs. One of the reasons why I love them is because of my training as a horticulturalist. Peatlands or peat compost is something that horticulture has used for the last 50 years. And I guarantee if most of you were to go to a garden center now, and unless you were very careful and checked every single bag, if you bought a bag of compost, it would have some peat in it. And if you've ever bought some herbs from the supermarket in the little pot, they are pretty much grown solidly in peat. Um, and if you own any house plants, I guarantee they're grown in peat too. And all the way through my career, for the last 25 years, I've been campaigning to get people to stop using peat in horticulture. Uh, 25 years, a lot of words, a lot of exposure, and still we're using peat widely. And in fact, the government still refuses to ban using it. So I thought, right, I'm going to take a, take a year out, quit my job at The Guardian, I'm going to immerse myself in the world of the peat bog and work out what it is about this story that needs to be retold so people start to take seriously why we should quit using peat. And in part of that journey, I completely and utterly fell in love with moss. 
So now you are coming on my journey with me to fall in love with moss. And hopefully, I mean, I imagine that nearly all of you are committed peat-free users if you're gardeners. But it's very easy to go to a garden centre and see a plant that you like and think, oh, but I love that plant. And then you look at the compost and you think, oh, I can't really tell. And you buy it. And unless it says it's peat-free, it is definitely not. Um, but there is also a bigger issue about why we should be concerned with peatlands. This is what a healthy peat bog looks like. This is in the flow country in the northeast corner of Scotland. It's around uh, 1,500 square miles of blanket bog. It is our largest wilderness in the UK. And until the late 90s, it was pretty much being destroyed. So it's only recently that people decided that it mattered. And then in the last 10 years, it has really become something that people understand is unbelievably unique for the UK, but also very important in Europe in terms of peat bogs, and is just about next year, fingers crossed, going to get its UNESCO World Heritage Site. So this is the gold star of peatland bogs, right? They should be really wet. They should be really varied and colourful. And underneath, this is a tiny little island. In, so you have these wonderful pools, and then you have these tiny little islands. And this island, all of these species, all the colour that you can see above them, is only there because of the mosses. So these are tiny floating peat moss islands. Um, how do I move along? Uh, here's another example. The locals call this mamba, <laughs> which is miles and miles of bugger all, um, which isn't really true. There's an awful lot happening. But the defining factor of any kind of peat bog is that when you first look at it, it's mostly brown and very flat. And it's only when you go onto them do you realize that it's a miniature kind of rainforest, essentially. So it is full of life, absolutely packed. And also, it has a terrain which is very varied. It goes up and down, up and down. So it's like a miniature world, basically. Imagine these being oceans. Um, and this is a good one. Here's another example of it. Start to see the patterns of the water. They should always be saturated with water. This is our local one. This is just down the road. This is um, Kors Vokna, which is in Borth, or known as Borth Bog. Borth Bog is a, so this is a blanket bog. Borth Bog is a raised bog. So once upon a time, well, 10,000 years ago, a raised bog was a lake. And then a forest grew up around the lake. And that started to remove some of the oxygen at the edge of the lake because the trees were growing into it. And so as the oxygen was slowly removed from the water, it started to become more acidic, and then the mosses could move in. And the mosses started to take over, and wherever there are mosses, you get more acids. So it gets more acids, the trees do less well, the mosses take over, and then they start to slowly creep across the lake. The lake fills up with lots of debris because it's now full of mosses. That debris sinks to the bottom, and it starts to turn into peat and the mosses do even better, until eventually the mosses have covered, completely filled in the lake. So that's the beginning of a raised bog. And then 10,000 10, years later, you get eight meters of peat and a very flat brown landscape, which I really recognize doesn't look like much. But oh my god, when you go onto it, it's the most beautiful, marvelous, life-changing experience. Now, <clears throat> because bogs nearly always look like this. They look brown and flat, unless you're very lucky to go to Scotland and see them looking like this. Most of them look like this. What that means is that they have had centuries of humans going, well, it's brown, it's a bit useless, isn't it? Uh, and actually, when you go on it, it's really wet and really boggy, and you sink, so it's totally useless. We can't do anything with this land. We can't run across it, we can't build houses on it, we can't send cows across it, we can't grow anything on it. Therefore, there's only one thing we should do. 
we should drain it. And from the 16th century onwards, but particularly in the late 17th to early 18th century, the Dutch came over and they taught us how to drain our bogs. So most of Norfolk is on peat. It's a different kind of peat. It's a fen. And a fen has a more alkali nature, whereas a bog has a more acid. But the fens no longer act like healthy fens because we have drained them. Now, there's one problem when you drain a healthy peat bog. It loses its water. And when it loses its water, something really terrible happens. Because peatlands worldwide store 44% of all of our soil carbon. That is more carbon than every living, growing thing in the world. So all the rainforests, all the temperate forests, don't hold as much carbon as a peatland does. And peatland makes up 0.3% of our land mass. So nearly half of our stored carbon is in peatlands, in bogs and fens and marshes and tropical peatlands, underground. So the stored carbon is in that deep, dark stuff that when you go to the garden centre and you open up your bag of compost, what you're delving into is probably 2,000-year-old peat that has taken a long time to A, get there, but also holds 2,000 years of past carbon. When peat is wet, the carbon is stored. When peat is dry, the carbon is released back as carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And right now, the UK has a lot of peatlands. It's got 13% of the land mass, which is a, is a lot. We're a really wet country, so we suit bogs. But there is more carbon dioxide being released by degraded peatlands than there are cars on the road every day. So that, like, there is a huge climate problem we have. We have a lot of this land, and we've degraded it in one of three ways. We drained it for agriculture, we dug it up in the past as peat compost or as fuel to burn, or we're currently overgrazing it. And when you put lowland sheep on upland bogs, they aren't the right kind of sheep, and also the way that we farm sheep means that we now don't move them enough, and they compact, and they eat away. The only thing that they really want to eat on there is heather, and they only want to eat the very top of the heather, but they don't, nobody wants to put sheep on wet, boggy ground for obvious things. Sheep aren't the most nimble things in wet, boggy ground, and they're made of wool, so if they fall in a bog, slowly do they sink and not come out. So what farmers have historically done is burn the heather. That's what a moor burn is, if you've ever heard of that, which is something that happens all over the north of England. Every late winter, early spring, you burn the heather with the idea that it regenerates. But what you actually do, so first of all, you have to dry the bog out. Then you burn the heather. You burn off the heather. It doesn't do very well. You only get a tiny bit of regeneration. So you don't get a great crop off it. But more often than not, when you burn the heather, because you have dried out the peat, you burn the peat. And a moor burn that's gone out of control, so it's got into the peat, usually burns for a year and a half underground before it burns out. So on the top, it looks like you can't even feel. And you dig down into the peat, and it's like a wood-burning stove at the end of the night. There it is, slowly burning away. So we have this huge problem, which is um, we have this fantastic resource. It is truly wonderful. It is fascinating as a place of, as, just as a habitat, as, as someone's home. But it's also really, really important to climate change. We have to immediately start restoring our bogs as quickly as possible, because if we let them to, to continue to decline, 
they are, like I say, the, on the smallest level, they're usually about two meters deep, but they can be up to 10 to 15 meters deep. If you release 15 meters worth of carbon, you're releasing around about 10,000 years worth of carbon. So that's not something that we need to do. So um, when I started on this journey, I wanted to find a way to make people fall in love with the boring brown space. Um, so I'm going to give you a little quick guide to the many different bogs you can find in the UK. So like I said, blanket bog. A blanket bog is nearly high, always found at high elevations. All bogs can only live because of one thing. They are only fed by rainwater. So they have no, no water underneath them. There are no rivers or streams or anything flowing into them. They are usually in sort of geological basin-like bits or high up on top of mountains where it rains so much that nothing else will grow but moss. And so a blanket bog is like a carpet and it blankets itself over the landscape. So if you were to go walking in any of the mountains around here, you'll be walking. If you see some moss below you, and I'll show you how to identify bog mosses, you are on a blanket bog. If you go down to the coast and you find the raised bogs, once upon a time they're called raised bogs because they had a dome, but they now look pretty flat and brown. And again, you look very much for this specific kind of moss, and you're on a raised bog. The raised bogs are slightly more unusual, and that's why they're exciting to find them. And then the final, very, my very favorite of all bogs are these ones. This is a quaking bog. Um, and this is down the, down the road, actually. It's about an hour away in Bilth Wells. And a quaking bog is a bog <laughs> that is floating on top of a 10,000-year-old lake. So if you were to go into the middle of this and dig a hole about a meter, maybe two meters down, you would find the lake still pristine there. And there's a quaking bog in Cheshire, which is a much deeper one than this one. Um, and all quaking bogs have something that's called the moor eye. So the, the moss always leaves a little exposed bit, nearly always in the middle, but not always, of the bog, where you can still see the water below. Something about it means that the water needs to breathe, and so there's a, basically a kind of breathing hole. The, mo the bog can't completely enclose it in, or else I think something something about bog life that nobody understands happens. Anyhow, you can go and peer in the moor eye in the Cheshire one. And somebody has actually dived down underneath it and had a look. And it is full of ghost-like trees that have fallen through and are like suspended in this 10 meter deep um, lake all white and ghostly, just hanging there. Because what tends to happen on quaking bogs is because of their mats are floating and there's a lot of water underneath them, trees tend to try and move onto them, and that's what's happened here. These are Scots pines. And on this quaking bog, somebody made a Scott pine plantation for timber 100 years ago, and the bog has dried out just enough for the trees to move on. So the trees have settled and they've got going. And if the bog dries out, although the conditions are very acidic, pine trees and birch trees don't mind that kind of acidity and, so, and some willows, so they start growing. But what has happened here is that the trees have hit the bottom of the peat and found the lake. So their feet are now in water and so they're stunted. So although that these trees are over 100 years old, they're actually only this high. So you, go on to, so you go on to this bog, and all around it are these huge 30, 40 foot Scott pines. And then as you go onto the bog, they just get smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, the great thing about a quaking bog is because it's a floating mat, if you jump on it, the whole thing wobbles. 
And so if you can get 10 people to jump on it, all the trees wave along like that, which is why it's called the quaking bowl. You can actually feel it move. Um, and here, just in the background, can you see there, peering up are the other trees, which are really, really tall. And then here are these tiny trees. Now, what's really interesting about this quaking bog compared to the one in Cheshire is in most quaking bogs, the trees get, they hit the lake, and then they get too heavy, and they fall through, which is why you can see these like ghostly underground forest when the divers went down into it. But these trees have learned to stunt themselves. So what's really interesting about this is that there must be a fungal community between these trees, the bog, and um, you know, some, other, some of the shrubs which have got into communication because one tree has clearly learned, if you grow really slowly, you'll do all right at this, and then taught all the rest. Because as you get to the edge, they start growing tall again. And the ones in the middle are actually, I mean, they don't look great, but they're actually doing really well for trees that shouldn't be able to survive on this. So one of the things that's very exciting about bogs and people are getting really into them is it was thought that they were places which didn't have a big micro, um, uh, fungal community and that that kind of communication that everybody knows about now, about trees talking to each other through mushrooms and fungal roots, Actually, it's just the bog has a whole new world, a very, very different kind of fungi that's there. But there's definitely, without doubt, a complete communication system happening on the bog. It's just wildly different from any one that anybody's seen on the forest. So that's the new exciting bit. Now, you can also have bogs in forests. So it is possible to have peatland forests, most forests around here. So if you walk back down through here, you'll see tons of moss. None of it is sphagnum moss. So none of it is peat building. The moss family is huge. There are at least, I think, 600 different big subgroups. So it's a huge family all over the world. But the mosses you see in most woods are just good, brilliant mosses. They need to be there. They're very much part of the ecosystem, but they're not making peat. Only one family can make peat, and that's sphagnum moss. And in certain kind of wet woodlands, you can get some mosses growing here. This is in the Havard estate. It was very exciting to find it. Now, you also will get peat forming in completely wet woodlands. So particularly if you are around here, but you find them all over the country. Um, and I tell you, a really good one for all you Birmingham folk is Moseley Bog. If the woods has some amount of permanent standing water, then the leaf litter will fall and it will start to decompose, but it won't completely decompose, and so it's building peat. So that's why Moseley Bog is called a bog, because that wood is actually very slowly building peat. But the best, quickest peat is actually done by mosses. So those are the three main, sorry, I'm always going too quickly through these things. Um, <clears throat> those are the three main types of bogs. And like I said, they, um, they are all defined by having one thing, which is their main species is sphagnum moss. And this is a bit of sphagnum moss, um, which I just stole from Mosley Bog. And I'm going to pass it around um, so that you can have a look, because the thing that makes sphagnum moss identifiable from all other mosses is that it has a capitulum. So it has this rosette-forming head. If you see the rosette, it's a sphagnum moss. And actually, when you look at this, bear it in mind, and then when as you walk around and look at the mosses, you'll see that they're all either map-forming or sometimes they are kind of stand upright, but they don't have this very distinct capitulum. So I'm going to pass it around. Try not to break it on the way around. Hold it by its head. It is still alive, has a jungle living inside it, so we want to take it back to the bog if possible. Um, <clears throat> so all bogs are dominated by these wonderful mosses, and here they are. This 
uh, this is the moss here. Good healthy bogs also have this, which is bog cotton. It's a kind of rush or a grass. After moss, bog cotton is the next species that builds the most amount of peat. Um, and then if they're also really healthy, they will have some heather, but they won't have that much heather. So if you were to go to the north of England now and walk up onto the moors, it would be completely dominated by heather. You know, and it does look fantastic when it's in flower. Nobody can deny that. But a peatland that is dominated by heather is a peatland that is drying out and therefore releasing huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So you want to see some amount of heather on your bog. Uh, and the best kind of heather is this one, um, Erica tet tetralix, which is this very thin gray one, because it's the one that can withstand the most amount of acid. Sorry, I'm looking for the... Oh, I thought I had a better picture, but essentially, maybe if we go this way, um, when you look on a healthy bog, see there, there, see how there is heather dotted all the way across it in these mounds, but it's not continuous heather. That is a really, really healthy bog. It's healthy because it's wet. You can actively very quickly see that there's sphagnum moss on it but also the heather is dotted about, and that's one of the indicators. So if you think, am I on peat? The first thing you do is jump. If it wobbles slightly, you are on peat. Peat is always a spongy, wobbly experience, even when it's dried out. Uh, but when you're wet, if you jump on it, you probably sink a bit. And if you keep jumping, you'll keep sinking, so don't suggest you do it. Um, and then you look for this smattering of heather, and then very quickly you want to get down maybe not on your hands and knees, because you'll get really wet knees, and try and find the sphagnum moss. And what you want to try and do is see as many different sphagnum mosses as possible. So, because not all of them are equal. So this is a really good example of a really healthy bog. So we have deer, a little bit of deer grass, but not much here. We also have bog cotton, just not in flower. We have really good, very healthy looking heather, and then we have these big mounds of the mosses which are building the peat. And you have, like, do you remember how I said that the terrain is actually very hilly when you get onto it? It goes up and down like this endlessly. And you have some sphagnum moss which live in hollows and live in pools. And the one that's being handed around, wherever it's got to, is a pool one. So it lives constantly in wet water, suspended in the water. And then you have hummock species like this. They have much, much smaller capitulum. They are tiny, and when you touch them, they're often warm. Really, on a sunny, sunny day, they think, oh, this is perfect. You understand why people think, well, I'll just go and have a little nap. They do look like places where fairies would sleep. Um, and these species hold just as much water as the other ones, but they have learned to grow very tightly together. So they conserve all their water can't lose any of the water, and then they make these little hummocks. And eventually, these hummocks can grow to a meter high, and they're usually about 50 to 100 years old. And then the hummock gets too heavy, and it sinks into the peat, and eventually becomes peat. And then that bit becomes a hollow, and the hollow species take over, and the hollow species get very thick. And then the hummock species think, oh, I can come along and live in there. So it's endlessly this landscape that's sort of doing this over and over and over and again as a hummock becomes a hollow. Um, yeah, so that's what makes them delicious. Too much of this is also, this is a lichen, um, it's called Cladonia, and too much of this is a sign that the bog is drying out. So again, you want to see patches of this white. It's a good thing to have it on it, but if the bog has become all white, it means it's drying out, and every time it's drying out, it's losing carbon, because when it dries, it starts to break down. So I'm gonna go into that in a bit more. Finally, and this is one of the joys about being in this area, <clears throat> particularly if you can be here around May, June, is you have this, which is the bog asphodel. Um, now, this is a wonderful plant that you get often in quite huge drifts over a good healthy bog. 
and um, it's called the bone breaker. Now, because a bog is so acid, whenever you have an acid environment, the calcium, if there is any in the ground, of which there often isn't much because it's very acid, gets locked up with the acid and so isn't available. And it's called a bone breaker because traditionally people did always graze animals on bogs. It was a very important spring bite. So it was one of the first places that you would take your cows and goats and less so sheep in the spring to go and get a good feed before the fields had got green enough. So you would take them over for a couple of, a couple of weeks, maybe a month. But it was thought that if they ate too much of this, they would become weak and this plant would break their bones. That's why it, its name is, in Latin, bone breaker. And this is what was thought traditionally for years. And actually, it's not that this plant will break their bones. This is one of the few plants that actually offers calcium on there. But if you keep your herd on the bog for too long, because the environment is so lacking in calcium, they will become weak. And what happened was they would break their, you know, it's a wet, boggy place, and they would break their bones. And to this day, farmers will often say, ah, but we need to dry the bogs because the animals will break their bones. They'll fall in and they'll break their bones. Even though this notion is, you know, it's not to do with this plant and it's not necessarily to do with the bogs being bone breakers. That makes sense. Um, okay, then, oh, uh, didn't, sorry. The next thing that's really exciting about it, but my picture didn't seem to work for some reason, is that they're full of bog bodies. And I did have a really good picture of a bog body, but now you don't get to see it. The other really amazing thing about bogs and why they are super exciting is that the bog, I'll leave you on a nice picture so you don't have to see that silly thing, is that the bog is also our library. So this amazing sphagnum moss, this tiny, tiny, tiny plant is the one that's making all of that deep peat, right? The smallest, most insignificant plant. In fact, when Linnaeus started, um, you know, in the 16th and 17th century classifying plants, he called this the lowest of plants because it was thought to be so, you know, evolutionary, very early, very basic. And yet, actually, what this plant has done is have its entire life along with us. So the sphagnum moss evolved in the Holocene, and the Holocene is the period we have just come out of because we're now in the Anthropocene, but the Holocene is our species lifetime. We evolved out of the Holocene, and the sphagnum moss is about as old as the human species. And the minute that we started being successful as a species, which is roughly around the Neolithic period when we started to be serious farmers, sphagnum moss evolves and appears and starts to do really well across the world. So we have a very much inherently tied in relationship with this tiny plant because we have always produced an lot of carbon and this plant has been the thing that has been sucking it up after us so what happens with the sphagnum moss is um i'm always really i always make slides i'm very dyslexic and um i make slides which make so much sense when i put them down and then when i talk they're never in the right order of the you know they do the magic trick um, so the sphagnum moss is amazing because it is more dead than it is ever alive. So if we look at, if you start, look, I can give you a bit more so you can chuck it around still. Um, if you look at the sphagnum moss, you'll see it's a very pale, oh, you've already got some. You can actually pull it apart and pass it around. I'm not gonna take it back to the book. I was lying. <laughs> um, uh, so what we're looking at here, if you were to look very, very, very closely at the tip of this, that's what we're looking at magnified. So this is this tiny, so even when you look at it now, you can't imagine that there's kind of another 
layer down of leaves. And what we can see here is that it's got loads and loads and loads of what look like air bubbles in it. And if we move along, we can see that there are big bubbles in it. So what's happening in the sphagnum moss that only one in 20 cells is actually alive? So along here, if I move up to the next slide, we'll get an even better example of it. Here is a tiny bit of chlorophyll. That is the energy house of the plant, right? Chlorophyll takes in sunlight, turns it into carbohydrates, allows the plant to grow. And then every other cell is dead. So this plant grows a tiny bit, produces a lot of dead cells, grows a tiny bit more, makes a lot of cells, kills them off, grows a tiny bit more, makes a lot of cells, grows them off. Now, these cells here are called hyaline cells. It's a completely specialist cell that you only find in this kind of moss. And their role is to act as a big balloon. They are full of tiny little um, holes that allow things to pass in and out. Can you sort of see that there's something in there? In these hyaline cells is a whole zoo. There's a whole world of amoeba and diatoms. So in here is an ocean of life living in between the cells. Now, the point of these cells is they take in water. And when they take in water, they can keep the plant alive. But they also keep, allow the plant to stand upright. This is called a lower plant because its vascular system isn't like a tree. So there's, like, there's nothing that holds it upright other than water. And mosses cannot grow any bigger than they are because they can only grow as big as the amount of water they can hold, right? So they don't have any water, they fall over. But also, there is only so much water you can pack and still have space to do photosynthesis. photosynthesis. So they're stuck at this size. And um, the hyaline cells take in water, hold the plant up, keep it alive, but if the water for some reason disappears, the hyaline cells exchange the water for air and shrivel down and then can stay in a resting state where they keep just enough water around the photosynthetic cells so they don't completely dry out, which is why you can have a piece of moss in a drawer, never seeing any sunlight, in a... In a Little, you know, it's got to be locked in some environment, but it's dried out for two, five, ten years. Take it out, give it water, back it goes to life. In fact, this is the, they endlessly send it to space in its drying state, and bring it back and refill it with water and go, wow, look, it can go to space and back again and still be alive. Which is much like the tardigrades, the water bears or the water piglets that live in them that have a resting state called a tun state. In fact, the entire ocean of animals, the rotifers, amoebas, all the things that live in there, all have a resting state. So everything in this world has evolved to have a dry state. But if the water comes back... Poof. Now, the only growing tip is the capitulum, which is why... It's not good to walk across bogs. It's not good to walk across bogs because if they're degraded, you will fall into water up to here and possibly drown. It's not good to walk across bogs if they're really healthy because the only thing about the bog that's keeping it alive is the top centimetre of the moss. And if you endlessly stamp on moss over and over and over again, you damage it. So that's why they always build boardwalks when they turn them into national parks. It's like they don't want you to fall in the water, but they also don't want you to kill off. It takes, on average, a single footstep in a bog takes 25 years to spring back. So you start to see that they are precious habitats. Anyhow, so one in 20 of these cells is alive, which means these plants grow very slowly. If you want to think of it in a different way, 
A healthy bog can grow a millimeter of peat a year. That's a very, very healthy bog. A restored bog doesn't lose its peat, and a degraded bog will release um, and lose 10 to 50 centimeters of peat a year. So when you think that a millimeter of peat is one year, and if you think about the peat moss that you have to use in, to burn or in your compost, you have to dig down at least a meter, maybe two meters to find the good stuff. Well, if you do the maths of that, you're digging up 2,000-year-old peat. So that's a lot of stored carbon, but it also takes a long time to get back to there. So one in 20 cells is live. And what is happening is that the peat grows always in this upward position holding onto water. And whoever's got the really long piece, if they hold it up, what they can see is by the time you get to the bottom, it's going brown. Around about here, there's not enough light for photosynthesis to occur anymore. So this bit is now thoroughly dead, and it's brown because it's still producing acids. And if I could have pulled the whole thing out of the bog, around about down here, it would just be the stem left. All the rest of it would have followed, fallen off. And what happens at a bog is the peat very, very slowly grows up and very, very, very slowly dies back. Now, this stuff is dying back, but it's not yet peat. What happens is, as the plant continues to grow, the dead stuff basically gets squished right the way down, so it's kind of compacted. And by the time it starts to compact by the weight of all the water and the growth on top of it, it is now in an environment which is completely devoid of any oxygen. And so it stops being able to rot. And what peat is, is zombie soil. So peat is soil that is in suspended animation. Because it's locked in this wet world and it can't rot back anymore, but it's slowly but surely being compressed, which is by the time you dig down into peat two or three meters down, it's like chocolate cake, it's like fudge. So compressed, but still so wet. It really does cut just like a really amazing piece of chocolate cake amazing slices out of it. And at this point, this is now why it's storing so much carbon. It's because it's not completely rotted down. But when it loses its water because it's drained or degraded, it's a zombie. The minute you give it something to animate it, it starts rotting again. And that's what's happening. That's why it's releasing all that carbon dioxide. The minute it's not wet, it's now going into its next stage which would be to rot fully down. So it's organic matter that is semi-rotted. If you want to think of it in some ways, it's a bit like your compost heap. Once it starts getting black, it's not soil, it's still compost. It's got 500, 1,000 years to go to being soil. Soil is the very, very end point of the whole rotting process. And the peat bog is thousands of years of semi-rotted compost kept in its pristine habitat because it's wet. Once it dries out, it turns back into very dry organic matter and it either washes away or it um, literally gets blown away. A huge amount of degraded peat gets blown away by wind or by you know, sheep running across it and it erodes off. So the mosses are marvelous, and they're doing all the work by, in, by keeping the bog both wet. Um, uh, let me just go back two seconds. But also, they're doing something extraordinary, which is they are keeping the bog acidic. Now, people always thought bogs were traditionally acidic because they were formed on slightly acid soils, and loads of this organic matter would build up in water. And they thought, oh, well, that will just make a kind of acid soup. That's why bogs are acidic. They, they would be slightly acidic. But if you're on a bog, the edge of the bog is about the same acid as your saliva, which is really very not acid at all. It's almost on the edge of being just very mildly acid. And as you walk into the bog, maybe you've got... I'm a, a quarter of the way in, it would start to be about the acidity of an orange. 
And then halfway in, it would get to a grapefruit, but by you in the middle, it's the same kind of acid as cider vinegar or lemon juice. So that's three to four, pH of three or four. That is distinctly acid. And the reason why it's so acid is because the sphagnum moss is keeping its environment acid. And this is one of the things I think I really learned about them. I realized that the sphagnum moss are endlessly teaching us that good old 80s environmental slogan, which is think global, act local. Because when you learn about the sphagnum moss, you think, oh, they're a bit, they're a bit, maybe they're slightly dictators. They are making this environment so acidic, no, nothing else will grow in it. In a healthy bog, trees can't grow because it's too acidic for them to grow. The, in a healthy bog, the heather can never take over because it's slightly too acidic for the heather to ever do successfully. And that goes on for all the other species apart from the sundews and butterworts. Everybody else cannot stand how acid it is. But by being acid, the plants can succeed really well in keeping the environment really basically antimicrobial. So one of the astonishing things about them is they, they stop things from rotting. So if peat is kind of rotting material that is suspended in kind of animation because it's not allowed to rot down, it's kept even more suspended in that an animation because the moss is pickling itself. So as it grows, it's basically fermenting. It's, bit, it's just like a pickle jar, and everything that falls into it can't completely break down, which is why you find the bog bodies, which I did have a great picture of, but then I lost it. The bog bodies are nearly all Neolithic people who were sacrificed and buried in what was thought to be years when the harvests and the food was not doing very well. Um, and what they would do in their communities is that they would choose someone who would be given a year of good living, and at the end of the year, they would be given some form of hallucinogenics, and then, frankly, very brutally murdered and pinned into the bogs in those open pools that you saw at the beginning, and then everybody would go and look at them there, suspended, and you would be able to see them because the bog pools are really clear. And this body would go from being largely pale, because they were nearly all uh, northern Europeans, and over time it would turn red uh, because the bog water is always red, and that's because of the acids in the sphagnum mosses. And, so the, and the body would be completely preserved, and they knew that the body would be preserved. And you would go back and you would look at one of your fellow gang there and be reminded of the gods that you needed to pray to. Essentially, they were there as offerings, and they were, they would have, people would have gone back and looked at them and gone, oh, look, there's what's his face lying there. Um, they would also bury very close to them hordes of butter which is why you get the bog butter term. It would have meant so much to these people. They are, they're usually, the butter is usually in these like wooden urns, about so big by this big. I mean, it represents a huge amount of milk product for these people. But they also would have buried this near the bodies as an offering to the gods. So they're there at the edge. Um, uh, to, and they were always at the edge of that tribe's realm, however far that they owned or lived. So they were also a slight warning to the other tribe. See what we did to him? They want to come over to our side because we might do that to you. Um, <clears throat> and historically, one of the amazing things about the bog is that because of the sphagnum moss and their amazing antimicrobial properties and this ability to create their own acids, everybody knew that they were really good freezers. And they recently did an experiment where they took meat and they kept it in a modern freezer for two years and they buried it in the bog 
and the meat that came out of the bog was fresher than the meat that came out of the freezer. So a lot, a lot of communities use the bogs as um, fridges, which is why when people dig them up for fuel and for compost, they eventually at some point come across these bog bodies, but they also come across bog butter, suckling pigs, um, uh, carrots, turnips, all completely preserved because the bog won't rot anything down. And they were just things people forgot, like buried, thought they'd come back to, never found them again. There were also like hordes of money. The Romans were really into burying huge amounts of money in them. Um, they buried gold. I mean, the bogs are full of extraordinary things that people have, I mean, people have always known that this is a place which is really good to hide stuff. And it won't, you can come back, well, as long as you remember where it is, you can come back and find it. Um, yeah, and I think there's an, a, an interesting thing about the fact that we are all kind of, you know, we are all Neolithic farmers. That's where we're all, those are our, all of us are ancestors of Neolithic farmers. And nearly everywhere in the world, we were wet people and we have become dry people. We endlessly want to try and dry things out. We get so upset, oh, our house is moldy and gosh dry ourselves out, we must drain this land, we must make our house on this place where it never gets wet, but we were all born of wet people. And one of the interesting things about our wet ancestors is until agriculture became dominant, and you know, agriculture as we know it is sort of a form of, even in the very earliest, a form of colonization, wet people were pastoralists, they were hunter-gatherers, you know, they were foragers. And if you lived on a wet place, they were the last people who um, were in some ways colonized. Because if you, let, if you could run onto a wet place that nobody else could run onto, then you were quite safe. And they were rich places. You know, there were beavers, there were otters, there were a huge amount of um, wetland birds that would fly over. There's a huge amount of medicine on these places, quite a lot of edible species. So the people who decided to live on the bogs, they were very much like independent people. Uh, the Romans hated them. In fact, most of the reason why we say bad things about the bogs all starts with Caesar and the Romans, who wrote endlessly about how the northern Germans were these terrible bog people. Because what they would do is when the Romans would come and try and conquer northern Germany, they would run into the bogs and stand on the only bits that they know wouldn't sink. And then they'd watch all these Roman mar soldiers march in their straight lines with all their huge, heavy material just get stuck and then have to run out of the bog. And they'd just stand there going, come on, come and get us. Um, so, I, th but anyway, that's a different, I've slightly got sidelined there, my exciting thoughts about the fact that we could all be independent wet people again. Um, <clears throat> I feel like I've no idea about time. Um, uh, let me just tell you a little bit more about why I think mosses are marvellous, and then I'll shut up. And if anybody wants to come and have a look, I only have one um, microscope. But the thing about them is that they do have this wonderful zoo living inside them. And if we take a bit of this moss and squidge it really hard, we can have a look down and you can see all the little insects and wonderful, weird, tiny wheeled animals and all the diatoms and everything else living between them because there's a whole other universe in this tiny plant, which is super exciting. Um, so the mosses build the peat. They are very important. If the land is degraded or dried, you lose the mosses. And if you lose the mosses, you lose the ability to build, um, to, for the peat to stay together and it starts degrading. Um, and so they, they are the most important bit. So this is a deliciously healthy bit of bog, even if you can't tell. Um, it is, it's green, a little bit brown. There's a little bit of dying bat heather, but there's nothing bad about it. This is what degraded peat looks like. This is actually, um, I took this picture a couple of weeks ago in Ireland. This is peat that has been cutting for turf to burn. Um, this is the Wicklow Mountains. I mean, I didn't, this makes it sound like I'm showing all the bad peat is in Ireland. I could 
take this picture pretty much anywhere in the Pennines. I can take this picture down here in Wales. I could definitely take this picture on Dartmoor, right? So I'm not, I don't want to suggest that I've done this because it's all in Ireland, but Ireland does have a lot of peat. And this is degraded peat. You see, so you've got lots of heather. The heather is not healthy. It's been burnt. You can always tell if heather's been burnt because it has these tall, white, ghostly stems. And then the regeneration's only happening up here. You can see the landscape is very brown. Peat is, is brown and definitely has an autumn brown. But in the spring and the summer, it should have very much a kind of greenish yellow flush. And this was taken in May. So it should be coming into its green yellow flush and it's not. But more importantly, you can see exposed peat. And wherever you are, if you find you're on peat and you see it's exposed, then you know you're on a degraded habitat because it should never, ever be exposed. Um, this is in the Breton Beacons where there is a particular problem with overgrazing and burning. And this is actually a restoration project to attempt to stop the peat from eroding. But as you can see, it's pretty brutal looking because all of this, all of these, if you mountaintops are all covered in peat. And here you can see the restoration project, which is slightly working on this side and not at all working on this side. What this is is huge coir mats that they put over the um, peat, which is bare, to stabilize it, to stop it blowing away. You can see these are trees down there, so you can see how high up we are. Um, uh, and they put down these coir mats, and then they try and seed the sphagnum moss into it. Um, here is more peat being cut in, um, in Ireland to burn. This is mechanical cut peat. So the problem with cutting peat to burn, and it's still done in Scotland, and it's still actually done in Manchester even. There's a few um, sites where they still cut it to burn because people are very nostalgic about this notion of smelling a fire that's on peat. Um, and then, of course, any whiskey you drink. Whiskey is made delicious by the flavor of peat, but the only way you can do that is to extract it. So whiskey, I'm afraid, is evil stuff. Although they are working very, very, very hard now, the whiskey companies, to try and use the most minimal amount of peat they possibly can. So we'll give them something to say for that. But um, the problem with peat is, A, it grows very slowly. So even though people try and claim that there is a sustainable use of it because it grows, it can't grow in any of our lifetimes. And you're always cutting up at least your great-grandparents' peat. Um, but of course... If it was cut by hand, you can only really... It's a hard work because you have to take the top living layer off to get down to that rich, fudgy stuff. And then you cut it, you dry it over the summer, and then you come back at the end of the summer, stack it up, take it, burn it. But there's only so much one person can cut in a day. The problem is when it becomes me uh, mechanicalized, which is what has happened here. Um, and you can tell because you can see the sausages are very even. When it's hand cut, it's got a much more kind of artisan nature to it. <laughs> um, and then, the, I mean, this is small scale. On big scale, it's done with combine harvesters. And actually, if you go on Google Maps now and have a look at Ireland and go into Google Maps on Ireland, you'll see combine harvesters digging up peat. I Ireland has um, agreed to stop digging up any more peat, so it's finally come to an end. But it's just playing through some contracts uh, that have to come out. So I think it has to finish by 2025. And then Ireland isn't cutting any peat, and we're not cutting any peat, but Canada, Poland, Estonia, most of Russia, um, China, huge reserves, looking to become the biggest exporter of peat around the world. So, like, I really cannot press upon you enough that, like, every time you buy that house plant or that potted basil from the supermarket, you are stealing someone else's habitat, but you are also digging up really precious peat from somewhere else in the world. It may not be from here. And so we all go, oh, we don't dig up peat anymore from compost. No, we just go and steal someone else's, which, you know, is not good behavior. On top of that, to make it much worse, there is peat, like I've been talking about, in bogs in the northern hemisphere, but in the southern hemisphere, in the tropics, the peat is actually produced not by mosses, but by trees. So tropical rainforests are quite often peat bogs. And recently, as six years ago, the largest 
slice of peat was found in um, the Congo. So it turns out that the Congo rainforest is sitting on top of a huge peat reserve. And nearly all of the peat that is most damaged and is burning currently in the world is in, in Indonesia. And it's burning because we cut it down to grow palm oil plantations. So nearly every single palm oil plantation, not only being bad because it's bad for the orangutans and bad for the loss of that rainforest, is particularly bad because we're growing that palm oil on peat, which is rapidly degrading. And the forest fires in Indonesia are some of the biggest release of carbon dioxide in the world right now. And every summer they have them. Um, so this is what degraded peat looks like, but this also, oh, this is a video, it doesn't really matter. This is um, a classic peat hag, where you, and you, if you go to the north, you'll often see a lot of this in the landscape, where you'll see this exposed size of peat. It's fascinating. Go and have a look at it. You're looking at very old organic matter, and sometimes you can look into it, and because it's so good at preserving things, you can see the old roots of trees that months, might once have grown there. Um, uh, bog oak is oak that has fallen into a bog, once grew there, fell over, got covered, and is preserved. And that's why they make that fantastically beautiful, very dark wooden jewelry out of it. It's an amazing thing because it's dense. And if it's been, when you take it out of the bog, if you keep it wet and slowly dry it out, it is this incredibly dark, beautiful, very dense wood that people love to work in. But these are all, I'm afraid, oh, it does. Did it do something? Did I make it play? Anyhow, it doesn't really matter. Um, it was showing, if you can see here, there's water running off it. Another sign that you're in a degraded bog is if you can see water rushing off it. Because like I said, they're only fed by clouds. So all the water they have should come from the sky and should stay within them as a system. So if they have water pouring off them, it's because they have a peat pipe, which is a damaged crack in the peat below which is allowing the water to trickle out because the amazing thing like about peat is it's like a kind of I always think of it like a rum rum barber do you know that pudding or like a you know or like um a sticky toffee pudding you know like when you look at the sticky toffee pudding the toffee is in it doesn't ooze out but you cut into it and then it all starts to ooze away and that's like a bog to be holding on to all its like good sweet juices and the minute you break into it, it loses them. Um, there's another peat hag. Um, and finally, if you're on the bog, and this is the other, and I will end on something much more optimistic in two seconds. Um, so this is very healthy, wonderful species of um, sphagnum moss, which has got this lovely wine red color. When the, the, the more red they are, the more antimicrobial they are. But when you see this on a bog, this slimy bit. This is because of um, atmospheric nitrogen, specifically ammonia from dairy herds. And the increase of ammonia in our atmosphere from dairy herds is because these are rain cloud fed places that exist completely on the rainfall. These clouds take in the ammonia and, and as dust and then drop it on them. And wherever the ammonia is deposited, then the, um, then the sphagnum doesn't do so well and rots off and dies. Uh, so, so we are doing a lot of bad things to them. But the good thing is we are actually trying to restore them really, really quickly. And there's a lot of amazing work. Um, people are coming up with the most wonderful, imaginative, inventive ways of trying to restore these peat bogs. They, mostly use a system where they use a, um, they fly over or use satellites and they bounce off, um, they use LADAR, so they bounce off a radar to the ground so they can see underneath the actual geology of the space and then they build up these buns on top of the peat which hold back the water and then the peat behind it starts to regenerate and then the next year they go and build a next bund on the following the lay of the land, and this bit starts to regenerate. And they will regenerate 
really, really, really quickly. So that's the most wonderful thing about them. Um, once you start to put water on them, they are so desperately, keenly alive to be being something. So my first thing is the peatland community is amazing. And if you're looking, if you're young and you're interested in ecology and restoration and conservation, I would really suggest looking into the peatland community. It has got a lot of money. It is a great job. You get to spend wonderful time up mountains, on bogs. Um, it's full of great technology. There's just, yeah, huge amount. Of, I, if I was young and I had my life again, I'd be throwing myself 100% into the peatland restoration work because it's awash with great jobs. Um, they are doing wonderful things. Uh, they need more support. One of the reasons why I started to write this book is that I want people to fall in love with them. I think one of the best things you can do up above and beyond not buying peat, not burning peat, trying to be palm oil free, is please go and visit your local bog. Everybody has one. They are all over the place. There's even one in the center of Birmingham in Moosley, you know. Please visit your bog and go and learn something about these wonderful spaces and go and look at these wonderful mosses. One of the things I find really interesting about them is that they are flat and brown. And you think, OK, I'm going onto this flat and brown bog. But if you can get into the middle of them, walk carefully, because like I say, you can drown. Um, <laughs> but if you can get into the middle of them, and lots of them that have been turned into nature reserves do have these wooden walkways out. And you can get to walk on one of these walkways, and you can lie down and lie on your back and look at the sky and turn your head to the side and see these wonderful hummocks of mosses. It is a really exciting place. There is something about mosses that we must have an evolutionary relationship with. Because you go into a woodland and you are calm, and you go up to a mountain and you are in awe of the view, but you go into a bog and you come away excited. They are really excitable places. I think it's the something about the many different colors of the bog mosses, which run from like yellow and green and pink and red, but also their varied habitat. If you can spend more than 10 minutes on them, if you can preferably spend an hour, you will come away like thrilled and full of life. I have not met a single person who doesn't get addicted to them. And there's a job in the peatland community which is called a peat prober because what we need to do is go around and find out how deep our peat is so that we can calculate how much carbon is in there, but also we can start to work out whether we, we need to restore it. And so there's a job it's mainly being done by very healthy, fit young men, but I feel like it really could be a place for lots of women too. And you go along with this stick, which has meter-long bits, which you tie up, and you push it into the ground, and you do it until you can't hit any further. And when you get to the bottom, you're usually on rock, and then you can count how much peat is. And there's this, yeah, a great job as a peat prober, where you go around, mostly in forests, trying to work out how much peat is underneath it. And I meet a lot of peat pro probers this summer, when I've been walking around interviewing people about restoration work and stuff, and they're all got this glow. <laughs> they have this like happy glow. And you say, what is it? What is it about this job? You spend hours on your own. You're walking around with a stick, just shoving it into the ground. And they say, yeah, well, we get to these places in the wood where they're full of the mosses. And the mosses, in, particularly in the woods, are the species which is this sort of very neon green. And they're like, if you hang out with these mosses for any amount of time, something happens to you. And they all say, these very serious people, they all come away with this like slightly trippy in love thing about the mosses. Um, so yeah, they are a place of, of great joy. So please, please go and visit them and find out a little bit more about the wonders of these joyous places and be more moss-like. Yes, they are very acidic and slightly spiky in their nature, but by making their world locally good, they do a huge global brilliance. And I think like, the more I find out about them, the more I think they are really wonderful beings. They are small, and yes, they are insignificant, but in their masses, they do extraordinary stuff. And I think if we could take one thing away is that you cannot 
on your own change anything, but many of us can change a lot. And uh, these small little guys, when they're brought together in a gang, they alter our entire world. They have made the world breathable for us. Like I say, they evolved with us as a species. And so it's thanks to them that we are here, really. And uh, if that small, tiny thing that's so easily overlooked, then that means there's 101 other of these things outside. So, um, yeah, please take mosses seriously. And if you want to come and have a look, I think, I wonder if we can change, I don't know if you can, can you, oh, look, it's actually in focus right now. So, ooh, there you go. If I can now, this is, this is the, I wonder if it will work. But this is a very, very, very dried out bit of moss, which has been there for, it's just a tiny fragment, one of the leaflets. And the moment it's in its resting state. I wonder if I can get it to, oh, maybe I've, can you see it? Itch. Maybe I can try and. Anyhow, you will see if you stay around for the next few seconds, it absolutely will start to swell up because they can hold 20 times their own weight in water. But also, as it swells up, all sorts of other things, oh, there, it's floating around, will start to come back to life and move around. So feel free to come and have a look if you want. But yeah, uh, and thank you for listening to my slightly eccentric <laughs> talk. Last of what has been.
probably the most incredible three hours of electric we imagined across the country at Civic House in Glasgow on Saturday the 10th of November. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Hi, everybody. I'm going to invite as many people to come nearer the front, if you can. And we, even though things are running a bit over all over the place, and people are just having a great time, I'm not going to force them into the theatre and pull them out. But for everyone who is here, we're just going to move with it. Um, and we're just going to host a little bit of a closing. Uh, even though there are people in workshops, there are people starting to make the journey home, and I really do understand um, for those who have been more anxious to start that journey home, given the journey that they had <laughs> here, we fully respect if you're grabbing a bag and getting out of here is no uh, disrespect at all to the hosting. Because somebody came up to me and said, I'm really sorry, this is really disrespectful, but I'm getting an hour earlier train. I just can't risk it. So um, there's lunch bags for those who aren't staying for dinner. You can grab one. If you're struggling with a trip to the train station, any of this, just come, come and talk to us. We recognize that nobody wants to go through what it took to get here. <laughs> I'm particularly looking at somebody who might have spent about 10 hours with five children uh, trying to, to get here. Um, but we're going to host a little closing anyway um, because I th we think it will be important. And remember, if anyone gets stranded or they're like, oh, man, I'd really love to stay, we've got some rooms. Um, so if you want to stay, just come and talk to us. I mean, Indy's going to kill me when she gets here and she's like, you've done what? There's 10, but there are rooms, I know, I've seen them with my own eyes. Uh, so if you're like, listen, we just want to stay, it's half term, uh, come talk to us. Uh, come talk to me and then I'll sweet talk Indy and she'll sort you out. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, all of those things, practicals, um, you know, talk to Indy and Sarah outside and make sure if you have to go quickly, take a lunch bag. So... Um, well, this has been a whirlwind, hasn't it? It really has. You've been through the washing machine because you were <laughs> one of those people that it took... We, we thought we'd write a book called If You Ever Get to Wolverhampton. <laughs> 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 because that's what happened to us. And we did get to Wolverhampton and then we had a pizza party eventually somewhere yeah. in some stately... It was really wild. Yeah. But it was just part of the adventure. Amazing. So, yeah, it'll go down in history. Um, Kate, could you just come back in a second? Get your mum. Siri, get your mum. Siri, get your mum to come back in a second. Okay. She's going to hate this, but... It's also brought lots You're of other people You're going to hate me, but we all just want to say a huge thank you for all the time, for the most wonderful talk you gave yesterday. And we're doing a closing now. Yes. A huge round of applause, and thank you very much. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, well, thank you, Siri and Cass, for being the most excellent uh, participants as well. And um, yeah, we are really grateful. Um, I just want to say it as well because it's on the line stream. There's lots of people that have come here with their children um, and have really immersed themselves and trusted the process, trusted their children to meet other children and the forest school and everything. We want to say bonded over like Taylor Swift. Know. Yeah, Taylor Swift bonded <laughs> over Taylor Swift. Um, sat on the train for hours on the floor, taking a taxi from Shrewsbury to McCuncliffe in the middle of the night, which some people did. We just want to say thank you so much. Lots and lots of love to those of you who are departing. Um, and yeah, thanks so much, Kate. If you missed Kate's talk, we've recorded it. It's already on the YouTube. Um, but yeah, okay, so we're going to host a little bit of a closing. Uh, we're going to say a few things. The poetry workshop that was going to do some poetry in this closing is overrunning. So let's just see, it's a bit of a lottery if that, if that comes in, but you've also put a guitar session in that <laughs> my nephew is very excited about. So after this, those of you who are staying, there's dinner and apparently well, a jam. Scott was out there earlier on when we were all feeling a bit like, whoa, and he was just strumming guitar, playing, and then ended up playing one of my favorite Foo Fighter songs ever. And I was like, that's amazing. And you said, not me, you said, the acoustics in here would be lovely to play guitar. I was like, do that. Put on an extra session. Do it in here. So that'll happen after yeah. this, I think, a little bit of just yeah. acoustic guitar and chilling amazing. out. And like, we're here till tomorrow, so if you're putting, still putting on sessions tonight, we'll happily help facilitate it. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Um, practicals and logistics out of the way. We're going to just host a little moment where we would love to just hear some reflections. Um, what's shifted for you? What has come up for you? This has been a, quite a bonkers gathering of practitioners from across 
many different disciplines, many different neighbourhoods, many different places. There's not many places this sort of group would come together. So we are, and I've heard all sorts of snippets of feedback, of challenge, of inspiration, uh, and we think it might be a nice moment just to close off and see um, what that has meant for you. So we'd love for you, and I'm sorry to do this. I know when somebody else does this, I'm like, oh, I don't think we've got any more <laughs> words left. But I promise you it will be uh, worthwhile. But we uh, would love you to just go sit next to someone that you don't know. Uh, if possible. I know that's the facilitator's worst thing, isn't it? But I promise you, we'll, we'll host this generously and lovingly. And we'd love to, for you to discuss for a couple of minutes each. So just do that sort of speaker-listener moment, let someone speak for two minutes uninterrupted, and then listen for, uh, uninterrupted for two minutes. And the question we really want, questions we want to hear about fr uh, from you is like, what has stood out for you this weekend? What has shifted? And what are you taking away from this back into your work, your neighbourhood, your street, your community? And if you're like, there's something else I want to tell the other person about, like what has stood out for me at CAP particularly, rather than Retrofit Reimagined, um, take that however you want. And then we're just going to do a little popcorn style. We just want to hear um, from some people because I think it's really important for everyone to hear from each other as well. I can and run around and... Through the mic. Tell everybody through the mic. Amazing. So we're going to have two minutes, two minutes. Uh, we'll let you know. I'll just put my hand up. I won't shout over you. That will just mean swap over. Um, do just trust me on that finding someone you don't know. I know it's like, oh, God, the facilitators like, <laughs> told me to go and meet someone I don't know. But just um, it would be lovely for us to connect beyond our immediate groups that we've travelled here with. So, um, yeah, two minutes will start once you've just moved around a little bit and we'll come back together at half past four.
it's a good sign that, you know, lots, lots has connected. Um, and uh, I'll give you a moment to, to get like uh, thinking about what you might want to bring up and then we'll just pass the mic around. But maybe Sarah and I can share a little bit uh, from our perspectives. I was going to, I'm really glad we got interrupted just now because I was about to tell you like this total transformative experience that I had. And then I was really worried that I was going to burst into tears again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Sarah, thank you so much for the session that you ran earlier on. Um, it was really great. We were, it started where we like had a little bit of an introduction about like just essentially connecting with nature and like understanding that we are nature. And then Sarah brought us out into this lovely um, grassy spot and we just did this whole meditation about like being a tree through the whole life cycle of the tree. And it was really lovely. <laughs> and at the end I was a mess. <laughs> and my little girl, Kira, who was helping Sarah, which was lovely, she was like, are you, are you good? You alright? <laughs> do, do I need do I need to stage an intervention? <laughs> I, 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 I don't cry for a lot of reasons. Don't we? we cry we cry for all sorts of reasons that are very nonsensical yeah. for children. But I thing was I knew it was going to happen, and I purposely went to your session because I knew I needed it. So thank you for that. Um, that was really great. So, but it really in terms of like what I'm going to try and take forward in my work from that is um, something that Magda said actually. You said, um, we were talking about um, governance and nature governance and um, how we change, how we govern things and who's governing and who has representation and all of that. And Magda was like, yeah, but like, who are we waiting for the permission from? And I think that's a really interesting question because suddenly you're like, oh, oh, what? That's a great question. Actually, why are we waiting? We maybe don't have to wait and we can just find not like bulldozery ways to do that, to bring it through and just say, I'm not waiting to be asked, I'm just gonna do it. But through all the lessons that we've learned about this sort of like gentle kind, kindness way of introducing these ideas, so that you bring people with you and, and, and just share that transformative way of changing, I suppose. So it was really, that was really amazing for me and I am so grateful for that all happening. So thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I mean, a, a real just moment that just happened was that I fell in love with Alice falling in love with Moss and telling us all about it. And it was just more that I uh, realised like how important it is for us to create the spaces where we can like, deeply listen to one another because I think that things are just... Everything feels more possible in that way when you're out in McCuncliffe compared to central Birmingham. Um, and it just was making me reflect on how... Uh, important this weekend had been and how much commitment people had shown to get here and I haven't unfortunately left this room very much because I was assigned to this on the schedule but everywhere I walked around and saw the m the thing that I believe in the most which is there's many different entry points whether you're in love with moss or you and you're telling everybody about peatland restoration or you're uh, playing with the hempcrete or you're uh, in the straw bale or you're in the forest school and you know high five to the people that supported the forest school and were running around finding coats finding kids finding parents uh, and and what i mean nets in our team for example you know i think i think she might need a bit of sit, a sort of sit down uh, at some point but um i guess for me it's the fact that we are coming together across radically different um, backgrounds, stories, experiences, skills, and just the joy and the community and the love that has been here. But particularly, I don't take it for granted at all what it's meant for our organisations to work together. I have seen collaborations like not even be able to get away from around the table before there's been a bust up. And I just have to say, like, if you saw the organizing group for this, there is a lot of just like stuff happening and we can make best heal Anthropocene Architecture School, ACAN, the CAT team. Like, it, it, there's so many others that I've, I've probably forgotten to mention. Everyone is just working together, um, flowing, making things uh, happen and making and that's really powerful. There's a lot of rehearsal in what I've seen this weekend that tells me um, there is a lot to be worried about, there's a lot to be hopeful about, but we know there are some things that are going to get very difficult in the middle. And I really, really do feel hopeful, actually, that there is a lot of practising of the behaviours it's going to take to have to try and come together um, beyond just relying on the state or relying on 
um, other people to do that work for us. That feels probably the most profound thing for me because mainly because I've been in the just us all barking orders at each other. Um, and the, the moment where we're like, it's time to herd everyone into another session and everyone just mobilizes. But those things are small rehearsals for the way in which we're going to have to come together and drop our egos and be in community with one another and trust each other's skills and knowledge. Um, and I, I feel like this weekend has really just been a representation of that. I just wish there was almost like one day more so we could just have a bit more spaciousness because we have been running, haven't we, between quarry walks and sessions and all of that. But you know, be grateful for what you have. And the last thing I wanna say is I'm really grateful for the hidden operations. And you can probably tell, I say this at everything we do, but you can probably tell the hidden operations on this one have been monumental. So to everyone who is taking people back to the station, all of that, these are like micro rehearsals of who we have to be when we have to start coming together in communities in radical ways. And I always appreciate that. I'm very grateful to have done it here. <laughs> Just smiling up at Phoebe, who's like writing notes and sticking them to herself. <laughs> 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 Phoebe, who's been sitting out there and like visualizing all these thoughts that people have had so beautifully on the wall back there as well. And Charlotte and Magda and Kat and everybody else is, yeah, it's great. Amazing. Okay, over to you then. So. Who, who would like to share? Just uh, take the mic and then pass it on to the next person. We'd love to hear anything. Maybe keep it to one minute-ish. That would be great. Anybody like me to come to them with the mic? It should be Kira, really, because she did an amazing job of facilitating our group. Um, so I'll pass to you after. Um, yeah, on the... The note of kind of um, rehearsing freedoms and embodying the the, the transition we want to see, I've, I've just been really kind of relieved and moved to experience um, how warm and friendly this space has been. And particularly, I'm here with my two young kids. And honestly, like from the minute we arrived, um, just being able for them to kind of run around and like, we don't always completely know where they are. And that's fine. And like, we left them in the playground and like slightly forgot about them this afternoon for like quite a long time. And we came back and another parent was like just playing zombie with them. I think he'd been doing it for quite a long time with like five other kids. Um, and yeah, I think it's really like you were saying in our kind of everyday lives, you, you, we kind of forget that that's possible. Um, so that's been really, really lovely. Um, my highlight is that I liked um, that how I was going on a walk on the mountain and it made me feel really relieved and happy. Oh, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to recognise the abundance in this place. I feel so grateful for everything that's been put on over the last uh, two days. It's just been so rich and such depth in conversation and depth in con connection. And even though you know I'm not from a built environment background, I feel really welcome in this space. And I think that it's a testament to the philosophy um, and the values in which this whole um, whole event is based on. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I think for me, the whole highlight of re retrofit reimagine has been with one word, hope, followed by healing. Just to get out of the city and be around trees. I didn't get to hug any, um, but <laughs> I may end up staying another night. <laughs> um, it's just been really healing and to meet so many people different people from different spaces, places, but coming here and feeling like we all connect and we're all one, it really does give hope that we can make changes together, whatever our background is. I'm 
Should we do a collective one? I think we were really just in love with community. And yeah, and that, I mean, I've only been here for like hot second, but you guys always are so good at making the space feel so in community so quickly. And it's always a joy to be able to tap into that. And just the many different voices that have been a part of that here, um, the topics that we've had, the different spaces that have been curated in different beautiful ways, and the spaciousness of that, and having the opportunity to, to draw out the interconnections that we are all here with the same goal, um, playing different roles within that. And it's been just beautiful connecting uh, in that way. Anybody got a desire? Yeah. Yeah, it was very inspiring. Thanks very much, everyone. Got to meet lots of people who we've had access study here at CAT, and it's very cool to meet people who you've read about and you've heard them talking and you've, in the lectures, and the lecturers say, oh, you must check out this. And, and there they are, you know. We got to chat, and that's cool. And uh, very inspiring. I have to add another verse to my retrofit song, so I have to figure that, you know, it's finished almost, but. Now I have to go back to the studio and just change a few bits. So thanks. <laughs> That's going to be good. Looking forward to it. Um, yeah, so I've been walking around photographing everything, and I always describe my job as like tapas, like I'm sampling all the different things, but never getting like a full meal. And even my life's like that. Like I don't have colleagues. Every day is a different person. So sometimes I feel like I don't have that many deep, meaningful connections. Don't get to spend the time to like really enrich it. But while I've been here, I've had loads of really good conversations and. It's kind of reminded me a little bit, but like in general, there's way more sharing in common with people than like I, 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 I don't. So um, yeah, thanks to everyone who's like I've had a nice chat with because it's been good to remind myself. <laughs> yeah, but of that. Um, I well, go with everything that's been said. I haven't been long at this event. I only came just before, just after lunch. <coughs> but I felt the same feelings before of feeling so welcomed and such an amazing space to enter and feel part of. So I made sure I got here. I, live in, I only live in town, but I walked up the hill and I basically had time for one thing and it was Alice's talk on the moss and the falling in love with the moss. And I feel like I was just, sometimes when you hear someone speak, you kind of just receive. That's how it, sometimes it just goes like that. And I felt like I was immersed in this other world. And um, it's, gonna, it's like a whole new piece that's been expanded in my, my view of the world, which is, thank you so much. But the real reason I wanted to say, speak right now is because there was a young woman sitting next to me. And she, when I talked about the moss and the fact that there are jobs, and Alice said, there are jobs for young people in the restoration of the mosses. And I went, wow, that's amazing. And she went and asked for the details. And so maybe there's someone who's going to go out and, I mean, you did say young, so I'll, <laughs> well, no, I wanted to do it as well. <laughs> I'll leave it for someone else. But I found that was a really lovely part of it. Who's that? Some great furniture painting was going on outside. This girl's got some skills. <laughs> I'd just like to say thank you so much for, to everybody just for the, just the care and attention and the attention to detail at every step of the way. I, uh, at lunchtime today, I bumped into a, t a tutor from university from over 25 years ago who teaches here now and it spends a week, a month here. It's like his dream job, so it was like, wow! <laughs> and uh, our family have had a wonderful time, the girls have had a wonderful time. We were in a space where... You know when you don't feel like going, <laughs> going anywhere? <laughs> no, really, I'm really. Cryers alike, cryers alike. With, what was, with, with what's going on right now, we were not in a space of feeling like going anywhere. Really. Um, and we're glad, we're really glad we came. <laughs>
So, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for thank, thank you for sharing. Yeah, uh, I you think so it's really brave. Thank you so much, Abbas. I've had a number of conversations uh, similar, and some of you will know that we were in touch with a number of people before to sense check about whether the right thing this weekend would be to cancel um, and allow people to go to the protest, be in solidarity with everything that's happening to the Palestinian people. Um, and the overwhelming um, feedback was like that we should continue to, and not let those things break the communities that are building. Um, but I want to say thank you particularly to people I've had conversations about who have shared quite vulnerably what this has um, meant really um, to, to their lives. Uh, I, I don't want to point anyone out because it can get a bit too personal at this stage and we're not prepped the space for that. Um, but I do want to say thank you and I want to say thank you to everyone for how they've shown up in, the, in that first talk and, and to be really clear, just like we talked about in the session with Quajo and Abdi this morning, that like there is no room for silence now. Like that absolutely we have to be in solidarity with one another and solidarity with sharing and spreading. Um, as much as we can, um, but also like really particularly, if you feel uncomfortable with sharing uh, in response to the resistance, just share the voices, the voices of people that are telling you about their communities, about their histories, about the stories that are being erased. Um, there is endless, endless stories of colonized people talking about what's happened to their histories. And so if you can't share in the resistance, share the joy and the stories, um, and support your neighbours. And there's plenty in this room with direct um, connections um, uh, to um, Palestine particularly. So, you know, tread carefully and thoughtfully, but certainly not um, in a way that uh, just takes yourself out of the situation and thinks there's nothing I can do. Um, but yeah, thank you very much and thanks for sharing. Thank you for everyone who came and trusted in the collective process together in a time where um, that was very, very difficult to, to do. Um, so, uh, one of the places where we, we got our attention to detail very wrong was unfortunately with Ajay, because earlier today, um, due to some phone signal issues, he was stranded at the station uh, for a long while. We are very sorry, uh, Ajay. Um, and so when he came, his workshop had to start much later. Um, and we're very grateful for, for everything that you've done. And for Ajay is an incredible poet and artist and facilitator, creative, um, based in Birmingham. And um, the amount of times I've been to CAT before and seen the relationship of the reservoir and the water here, um, and having been on the water walk a number of times with Seven, um, we were just convinced that Ajay would be one of the most beautiful artists to bring here with us. We're very sorry for the moments that you did miss out on, though. Uh, it was definitely on us. Um, and. Uh, Thank you for facilitating the workshop. And Ajay is going to share some poetry um, and share a little bit from his uh, perspective and the work that he does. Um, he's, he's made a real effort to get across the country today. So please do give him a really warm welcome. And I'm going to, maybe we'll give that mic to you. And we'd love to hear a little bit about yourself, what you've been up to. Cool. Uh, lovely seeing you. Uh, uh, it's actually very lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for holding space for me. So my name is Ajay Sun, and among other things, the main things that I'm known for is I'm known as a poet, um, but I'm also a community organizer. I deliver workshops kind of in different schools around uh, my region, and a lot of my work focuses on mental health, climate equity, and social justice, human rights. And in different schools and locations, I kind of use art with my friends to kind of break down and like simplify and make some of the concepts more digestible for young people. So like at the moment, as young as seven, and kind of just, yeah, just thinking about belonging and different things such as that. I think one poem that really sums up all the work I do and my passion is a poem called Daikon Radishes. And I went to a school that's in Handsworth, and in this school they were growing um, radishes with the youth. Well, they were growing various fruit and vegetables, but one of the vegetables they gave to me was the radish. 
And so I kind of took that away and I've always held on to that story. So this poem is called Die Conrad Radishes. Hope, lemongrass propagation enters your mind when you hear of cuts. Hope you know more on how to bury daikon radishes than friends. Hope the first blade you think of is from the story I told. Your great, great grandfathers, gentle mahogany man, cut cane to pave ways. When atmospheric pressure rises, hope you do not place a hose pipe ban on tears. Hope you are able to speak about the pressure before it becomes unbearable. It has, for many of our youth, the world just began to know. Consider my friend Bella, about to start university. Text me the night before she slipped away. Told me I would do great. My dawn reply I received no second blue tick. Hope you continue to hold your hands out. Use them to turn. Plant trees. Make the air lighter. But not to bruise. Know that this does not make you less man, but more human. Hope you grow as wild and sweet and strong-rooted as daikon radishes, the ones St. Michael's kids cultivate in their playground. But most of all, I hope you take your time. Thank you. All right, so the next poem I'm gonna read is not what I plan to read, but on the train today, I spent the most time, a lot of time writing, and so this poem is called Statement. Um, it's interesting to me that um, in a lot of places, like ancestrally for me, there was, um, my, my workshop today was about folk tales and water, but there's also um, folk tales for me ancestrally about flying. There's a legend of flying Africans, which appears in, in many parts of the diaspora across the Americas. And flight has always been linked to liberation. Um, and so this poem here is, is about another bird, um, the sunbird. Somewhere there is a sunbird, molts away old feathers, makes room for new iridescent tufts under his wings like a flame. He preserves the gentleness of his guardians in songs. Wings defy the trap doors. Out of the windowless prison he soared, from the villages to the mountains to the valleys carried a small amount of his soil across the sky. From his beloved ground, remembered the taste of her nectar on his tongue, where the playground used to be, before the F-16s, where the olive tree stood to praise grandmother light. Now there is no sunrise song for the 13th day, only misty morning. The olive tree did not see the children and their guardians on the after school walk like I did. I saw a seven year old tell his friend, it's sunny over here, but rainy over there. So that boy become a rainbow in dark clouds. In my head, I heard June Jordan ask, where are my loved ones? Pollination became a buzzword. We listened to the laughter of evil while we ate our morning bread. There was less and less space for our wings, silenced by the false motives of clouds. We had to become sunbirds, keep an ear to the ground. Now, 
we are telling you that if the child could speak, the one whose father left him at the hospital with the doctor, whose father returned to see no doctor, no child, no hospital, among other things, he'd want you to know he was a rainbow too. Thank you. Um, I kind of just want to end it off um, with, with a poem to kind of just, um, yeah, I want to, I write peace um, and I want to leave you with a piece of peace and see how that feels for you. Um, but yeah, I think it's very important for us in these times, in times of crisis, to hold each other and be there for each other. So yeah, be, be there for each other, be kind, be considerate. Um, so this final piece is, um, I'm gonna leave you with the piece of peace. And this piece is called August Youth. At the start of the summer, I wrote a poem and I was worried about, um, like in the summer sometimes there's like a rise of um, knife crime. And so I was kind of worried about like the summer and how that would be. Um, but by the end of the summer, like I'd worked in an in a, in a art gallery with like some, with some young people for two weeks. And we did like a summer camp where every day they had an artist come in. And so by the end of the summer, I felt, I had this experience and I wrote it in a poem called August Youth. And so if anyone knows Birmingham, do you know Summerfield Park? Yeah. All right, cool. So this kind of, this summer I really fell in love with um, beech trees. And so this is kind of related to that. And also like everything is the, on the intersection. So this is August Youth. I saw at Summerfield Park a young beach surrounded by friends that conversed in green parakeets the way the boys at the youth center bust jokes while they flew paper planes, played ball, made drawings. And the tree, bending, rotating, circulating, reminded me of my baby cousin in a dance-off with his dad. As he spun and cartwheeled on the ground, then moved in slow motion. And if someone gifted me a beach seed, the way the youngers at summer camp were gifted parsley cuttings and beetroots, I would plant them in a park like this, where they could grow different shades of moss, change the color of their leaves from green to copper, without need of an explanation, and still feel like they belong to this soil. Because I know how it feels to grow solitary, to spend most of my life living as if strength is the ability to survive on a sidewalk where my roots are paved in concrete and I do not ask anyone for help. Cool, thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm Ajay's son. Um, I'm friendly, so please come chat to me after. Um, and I'm just really grateful for this space. And as I said, like, it's difficult times. And um, yeah, as a writer, I think sometimes you, you, you reflect the times, you know, as an artist. And so kind of navigating all of the feelings can be difficult, but this is why we got each other. So let's be there for each other, like nature, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, I don't think there's much more for us uh, to say. Um, and there's really no point, is there, trying to say it? <laughs> what can you follow? Can you imagine filling the, filling the silence after this? Thank you so much, Ajay. Um, we just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you to everyone at CAT. Um, thank you to everyone who has been working behind the scenes to make um, all the operations work. Um, but really particularly what 
I just want to say about what I hope people take away from this weekend and this series of Retrofit Reimagined is there genuinely is a role for all of us. There is genuinely a role for all of our knowledges, the skills we bring. Even if we turn up and we've needed to just not participate too much and just float around and restore and repair whatever's been going on to go back into your communities or into your work. Um, that, that's also so important. And that throughout this and the last few um, sessions, uh, last few sites in Bristol, in Birmingham, Balsall Heath, in London, there are loads and loads of tools and stories and frameworks and follow-ups and things that we can share um, and to not um, feel like please do reach out to us to make connections uh, keep sharing take back what you have learned into what you're doing and um, at Civic Square we're particularly interested in what it means to spark that first conversation with a neighbour or that first cup of tea or the first bit of organising that might uh, help to bring something else about. So if you're struggling with that, or you're thinking, I don't know what to do with everything that I've heard and learnt, uh, please do come and talk to us. But I know that Sarah and Melissa and many others who are in the room also come at this from really different points. So um, it will be nice just to like hear from you, like the closing reflections of how people should get in touch with you and what they can look forward to in Glasgow if people choose yeah. to come. So we if you're ready for another cast, like <laughs> massive travel like thing that will hopefully be a great adventure. Uh, Maybe leave 24 hours earlier yeah. than, <laughs> than we thought. Yeah, come to Glasgow on the 11th of November for, I guess, the finale of the series. Um, and we'll... we'll, we'll it, I think we were, I was reflecting on this with Melissa, like there was a, there's a very particular energy to each of the different sites. So we had a very hands-on making, free, delightful experience in Bristol. And I think this has been like deeply grounding here. London was brimful attention, but it was also very like interesting. And sadly, I wasn't in um, Birmingham this year, but last, and I know that was a real deep dive. See what I did there? You're in a swimming pool. <laughs> <laughs> but so Glasgow will be another vibe and I don't even quite know quite how it's going to go but it's going to be lovely and it's in the aptly named Civic House um, and it's going to be a great a great thing so there's an event right up same things apply as Imi has already generously said about the access fund or if you want to bring your work to us in Glasgow then please do get in touch um, with us and we can talk a little bit more about what we're going to um, do there. Um, yeah, I guess for me, I feel like I started my journey very much in two feet in the built environment as an architect by trade and then getting more into activism and then wondering more what my place was, what my role is. And I think there's quite a lot of people now who are in that sort of space. I can look around, I can see people, I can see Tab. I know Charlie's in that space. I know there's quite a lot of people who are sort of like trying to take their work um, from here right back into the building firm at Alistair, you know, right back into um, the place that where our journey started because the built environment is responsible for 40% of total carbon emissions. So going back out to that scientific bit, we've got a big role to play to try and bring everybody with us. So I feel like the work that we will take back is to try and be um, more in that transition of bringing people across. But I also just personally wanted to say a massive thank you to the Civic Square team for being so generous. I've had conversations with people and asking them what the biggest takeaway today was. And nearly every person starts with the generosity of hosting. And I think that has been so profound. You just say yes. You just make that happen. And that's not an easy yes to give. You know, it's not easy. You've got to go digging deep into all sorts of sticky places to make this happen. Well, and this you is, do. This is a perfect time to say, I say yes. And then she's gonna hate this. And then a wonderful like head of ops, Indy, actually makes that happen with an amazing team. You've probably spoken to her, Nikki and Sarah, about everything. And I, I, you're gonna hate this so much, but that's where this really comes from. So I really want to say thank you to that team and everyone connected to that across We Can Make, across everywhere. Because the, the work is this, right? Like making it happen. So huge high five. Let's give her a really embarrassing high five. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
can I can I add something? Another yeah. extra gratitude. You also left this morning to take your son back to Birmingham to do a cross-country run and brought him back here again. And here you are again as well. So it's like layer upon layer of like <laughs> superhuman yeah. capability. But I do think the wider story here is, because I know Indy will hate this attention. Um, and luckily we're best friends. So every time I say yes and she's like, why did you say yes? This is not actually possible. Then uh, I just buy her a coffee on Monday and I'm like, thanks so much for making that happen. <laughs> but there is a wider reason why we celebrate organizing an operations and orchestration so much in our team. Like, it is the lifeblood of the work. You, this is not what you need to do to make. In fact, this is like the one bit of the work. We stand up and we have some skills and some like mandate from others to like do some of this. But the real work is right in the hearts of all of that labor. So don't, don't aspire to this. We're just one God, part. No. We're like mouthpieces, <laughs> right? Um, like, you can organize in and all those roles, the roles that make the tea, that help to share stories, that set up a room, that do, that is the work that makes the work work. Ooh, there we go, that was a nice <laughs> sentence. And so I just really want to encourage everyone to make sure that they decenter the gaze of everyone off on, on the stages. Like, if you have a, a skill in sharing that and all of that's amazing, but really this is at the heart of the work. So the best thing we can all do is go back to our homes, our streets, our neighborhoods, our organizations, and roll our sleeves up as best as we can. Um, and so it's uh, really important. It's not just to embarrass Indy. It's actually to really say that that radical admin, that operations, that orchestration is at the heart. And, and you know, you all have that, whether you're a teacher in a school and what you do every single day, or you are like uh, selling the gospel of the mosses, um, like please come with your whole souls to this work because really what you bring is, is critical. And some of that stuff that society makes boring, labor of care, of organizing, of tidying up, of, of love, of a bit of support, a bit of repair. That is really the, what's super duper important. So last chance, um, I asked Melissa, I don't know if you want to say anything because one of the organizers. Yeah, be careful what can happen to your life yeah, if you. <laughs> not being, no, 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 it's not, it's not about being, being careful, it's be ready. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, Everyone's thank you invited. So much. Does anybody else want the mic to share anything? Uh, last, last call. We have dinner, we have guitar. Oh! Share one word, joy! Yay! Oh. <laughs> thank you, John. There is now dinner. There is some people staying over. There are a few people who might have changed their mind. And if you have, we might have some accommodations to quickly come and talk to us. Uh, there are trips back to the train station. And there is, you can have the last word. Go on. Well, we're going for a walk. Oh. We're going to go for a quick walk. We're just going to go for a quick walk up the quarry walk uh, to stop D um, before the light goes down. And the reason for that is just to do a very quick uh, drone demo. And what would be great would be uh, to get a group photo of whoever can make it up there. Uh, before the sun goes down, which Amazing. is pretty soon. So Who that was all. Just an invite to everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks. And a coach going back to Birmingham at half five. Yeah, it's a coach. Coach is at half five back to Brum. Is it? Okay. Five thirty. Okay. It is time.